Bills' Bill Bate with the base hit to right field off Randy Myers. Gorelts comes around, beats the throw. The Reds protested the call, but to no avail, the Giants, a winner over Cincinnati by a score of 4-3. to three. L.A. beat Atlanta in a 5-hour, 12-inning marathon, 5-4. to four. Mike Sharperson with the RBI single in the 12th to win it. And San Diego got Joe Carter's 15th home run and Jack Clark's 16th to beat Houston 6-2. Well, the Yankees are apparently close to a deal to keep Deion Sanders in pinstripes and out of a Falcon football uniform until the end of the baseball season. That pack reportedly will pay Sanders $2.5 million. Want to talk about salary structure? If those numbers are accurate, the only Yankee to earn more than Sanders in 1991 would be Gold Glove first baseman Don Mattingly. And remember, Sanders is batting 154 going into tonight's game. When we come back, we'll tell you about the tale of the tapes in the George Steinbrenner Howie Spira Showdown. CBS Sports presents Major League Baseball. Today's pregame is brought to you by Wheaties. Better get your whole grain, better eat your Wheaties. And by Advil, advanced medicine for pain. Once again, we stand on the courtroom side of sports. First, the George Steinbrenner saga regarding his $40,000 payment to admitted gambler Howard Spira. It's really two cases in one for the Yankee owner, one side being decided by the baseball commissioner and the other by a court of law where Spira stands accused of extortion. We asked Spira's lawyer, David Greenfield, if he had tapes of conversations between Spira and Steinbrenner and if he would call the Yankee boss to the witness stand in the extortion case. Mr. Steinbrenner knows that we do have tape recordings. What he does know is how many we have. And uh, I'm not about to let him know on public television before we get to court. That's something he'll have to find out when he gets on the witness stand. Greenfield had no comment when we asked if he has provided his tapes to Faye Vincent. However, the commissioner's office has confirmed to CBS Sports that it did receive tapes. And Vincent's staff also confirmed that George Steinbrenner has provided his own tapes of talks with Spira to the commissioner's office. Earlier today, our Tim McCarver asked Vincent when he expects to resolve this case. I'm working hard on the case. I don't think it's appropriate to talk much about it. When I get uh, a resolution, I'll uh, announce it, and I, I hope that will be the end of it. Will that be the end of this week, do you think, or next well, week? Is it going to drag on? No, I, I hope it doesn't drag on. I'd like to get it done this week. Turning to the Pete Rose story, Rose is expected to check in as early as this coming week to begin his five-month prison term. He's heading to Illinois, and here's what awaits baseball's all-time hit leader. Rose is on his way to the Marion Federal Prison Camp. Its almost park-like setting is home to some 200 inmates, all housed under minimum security with only two corrections officers on guard. Inside, the inmates sleep two to a room with the atmosphere of a college dorm. Rose's pending arrival hasn't made much impression on his soon-to-be fellow inmates. Not just a small talk now about Pete Rose, about him coming here and all that, but I don't think it's really going to change anything. He's just another human being like the rest of us. He's just better at hitting the baseball than me, that's all. But if he wants to, Rose can keep up with his Reds in the prison rec room. You'll also have to work seven to eight hours a day, and not for superstar wages. Would you believe 11 cents an hour? It's just a shame that uh, you have to meet somebody of his stature under these conditions in a prison. And, um, you know, it's a little rough. Anybody loses their freedom, regardless of the circumstances. And yes, there is a baseball field, home of the team nicknamed the Outlaws. No one's sure if he'll play, but one thing is certain. Pete Rose will be a long way from his days of Major League stardom. Meanwhile, the baseball trading deadline is July 31st. And yesterday, Toronto picked up pitcher John Candelaria from the Twins, and the Red Sox got some right-handed hitting help in Mike Marshall from the Mets. One team primed for house cleaning is the St. Louis Cardinals with eight free agents at the end of the year, including stars Willie McGee, Vince Coleman, and Terry A. Pendleton. Earlier today, I spoke with Cards General Manager Dal Maxville and asked him how close he is to a deal. I have several conversations going. I'm sure if you ask any general manager that at, uh, at the trading deadline here a few days before the trading deadline, they'd probably say the same thing. Uh, I'm always optimistic and hopeful of doing something, but uh, you never know for sure. When we come back, Warner Wolf with the always entertaining Plays of the Month. Welcome back, everyone, and a special welcome to my colleague, Warner Wolf, sportscaster for WCBS-TV here in New York with the bestest plays of the month. <laughs> All right, thank you, Greg. Uh, first, I was thinking if the Yankees give Deion Sanders $2.5 million, and considering he has only 20 hits, that would be more than $100,000 per hit. 
which uh, would st uh, set a new standard, I would think. Fortunately, they can afford it. <laughs> okay. All right, let's go to the videotape, the plays of the month of July. Here we go. First of all, the best catch by a right fielder going back to the fence. Felix Jose of the Oakland A's, who takes a home run away from Robin Yount, then falls back, loses the ball, but holds on. The best diving catch by a right fielder coming in, former Michigan quarterback Rick Leach of the San Francisco Giants. The best diving catch by a left fielder going back. It's Rex Hudler of the Cardinals. The best move after a catch by a center fielder. Bo Jackson against Baltimore, who makes the grab and then climbs the wall. Spider-Man Bo Jackson. The best play by a shortstop. White Sox, Ozzie Guillen. First, the dive, the flip, and the force at second. The best track and field effort on a pop foul. Astros third baseman, Ken Caminetti, who first high hurdles the fence and then runs into the dugout. The most exciting play involving two football players, Deion Sanders' line drive by Bo Jackson. There goes Bo, and here comes Deion. Deion going for the touchdown. The throw to the plate. He leaps, misses the plate. McFarlane misses the tag. Deion dives back, is safe. Inside the park, home run. The best home run in batting practice by a professional basketball player, Michael Jordan of the Chicago Bulls, and it's gone off the upper deck facade at Comiskey Park. The worst example of base running by a 35-year-old, Mickey Hatcher of the Dodgers. Is he out of gas or what? The best new high five imitation, the Kansas City Royals trainer rewarding Bo Jackson after three homers. And finally, the best example of being caught with your pants down, White Sox Steve Lyons, who after diving in the first, decides to dust himself off, but forgets where he is. Come on, Steve. The plays of July. We must always remember where we are. <laughs> That's right, Greg. Warner, before you go, I have the radio call of the month. During Thursday's Mets-Phils game, New York led 10-3 going into the ninth, then watched Philadelphia score six times with not a single hard-hit ball. Listen to the frustration and relief in the voice of Mets broadcaster Bob Murphy as New York holds on to win with the tying run on third. Here's the pitch on the way. Line drive caught. The game is over. The Mets win it. A line drive to Mario Diaz. And the Mets win the ball game. They win the damn thing by a score of 10 to 9. And win it on a line drive to end the ball game. Oh, wow. Like I said, we always have to remember where we are. Suppose the Mets had lost. <laughs> right now, we are almost set to play ball. I'll be back throughout the afternoon with scores and highlights. Sports coverage of Major League Baseball continues after this word from your local station. You're watching WHBF, the Quad Cities Channel 4. On the south side of Chicago stands baseball's oldest monument, Comiskey Park. Chicago last saw a pennant winner here in 1959, but this year the White Sox have turned back the clock setting the city of Chicago on fire again while catching the rest of the American League with its pants down. Comiskey Park will close its doors after this season, but today it's baseball as it's been since 1910. The White Sox and the Brewers as CBS Sports presents Major League Baseball. And welcome to Comiskey Park in Chicago on the south side and behind it, the new Comiskey Park. So 80 years of memory will come to a conclusion after this year and new memories will evolve in the new stadium which opens up next year here in Chicago. And we have a beautiful afternoon for baseball. Kind of muggy, a little overcast, but a good day nonetheless. Hello again, everyone. I'm Dick Stockton along with my partner, Jim Cott, who played with the White Sox in the 70s. We'll get some of his views of Comiskey Park a little later on. But the big story today, Jim, has to be the Chicago White Sox who continue to hang in there against the Oakland A's in the American League West. They're now two and a half games behind, even in the loss column after the White Sox won last night and the A's lost their second in a row. Question is, what got Chicago to where they are? A great turnaround from last year, and what do they need to hang in there, Jim? Well, how important is pitching in Major League Baseball? We talk about it often. The White Sox have scored the same number of runs through 94 games this year that they did last year, but they're in second place. Why? 
great pitching and especially in their bullpen and that has to maintain throughout the rest of the year if they're going to upset the Oakland A's. Now there could be a good story in the Eastern Division of the American League. No one is really taking charge. Toronto has the lead but notice Milwaukee is only six games back in the loss column even though they're in sixth place right now. So maybe a winning streak by one of these clubs will put them in the race. The question is can Milwaukee realistically do it. Well in the American League East they can because nobody's really run off with that division but in order to do it they've got the worst defense in the American League. Their pitching has not been good. Those two areas have to improve for them to win. Teddy Higuera who's really had his problems on the mound for the Brewers will be pitching for Milwaukee and Melito Perez who has a no hitter in six innings of work this year for the White Sox. CBS Sports presents Major League Baseball. Today's game is brought to you by Toyota's quality line of cars and trucks. Toyota I love what you do for me. The companies of the Prudential come to the Prudential and build your future on the rock. And by Budweiser, the king of beers, remember no when to say when. Here at Comiskey Park, the White Sox have taken the field. 20 games now, over 500, and here they are defensively as they'll face the Brewers. And taking a look is Jim. Well, Yvonne Calderon has developed into the best left fielder in the American League. Is in left. Dave Gallagher will play center today against the left-hand pitcher Sammy Sosa in right field and around the infield. Boy, is this young man coming on. Robin Ventura at third base. Ozzie Guillen, great shortstop. Scott Fletcher has been solid at second, and Carlos Martinez will play first today. Always day game after a night game. Ron Karkovice will do the catching, and on the mound, Melito Perez. Perez nine and eight on the year and he'll face this lineup Darrell Hamilton leading off in right field Robin Yount will be in center field Gary Sheffield playing outstanding ball at third base veteran Dave Parker he's having a terrific season the designated hitter Greg Vaughn will be in left field Greg Brock is the first baseman B.J. Surhoff catching Jim Gantner will play second base and Bill Spires is the shortstop. And on the mound, it'll be Teddy Higuera. But a look at Melito Perez, who spun that no-hitter six innings. Good enough for a no-hitter against the Yankees July the 12th. Well, pay close attention to Melito Perez in this first inning or two, because if he gets to about the sixth inning, he's practically unbeatable. Only Nolan Ryan has a lower batting average against than Melito Perez, but he's had a lot of difficulty in the first couple innings. Good live fastball and a fork ball or a split finger, whatever you care to call it and it's command of that in the early going that determines what kind of success he'll have. Let's take a look at the umpires working today's game calling balls and strikes is Tim Sheeta. Rick Reed will work at first base. Daryl Cousins is at second and the crew chief Terry Cooney will be over at third base. Tom Treblehorn the manager of the Milwaukee Brewers you remember he was suspended for five games in that brawl with Seattle he wasn't overly pleased with that. Talking to Etchebarren, who's the first base coach, and Jeff Torbor, who really has done a tremendous job in reversing the White Sox fortunes. They lost 92 games a year ago. Okay. Have we had a contrast from week to week? Last year, we, last week we got Zimmer and Craig, a couple of good old boys from the Dodger organization, a couple of throwback hardball players, and this week two very studious guys, Treblehorn and Torbor. Got a button down manager, yeah. you might say. All right, Darrell Hamilton steps in, and the first pitch of the game swung on and missed on a fastball, strike one. Hamilton has been in 50 games this year. Born and still lives in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He's a rookie. Had his press, best pro year last year at Denver. High fastball is out of play. This is an area of concern for Tom Treblehorn. Last night it was Mike Felder. Today it's Daryl Hamilton, the leadoff hitter. Without Paul Molitor, this obviously is not as good a ball club. And trying to generate a little activity at the top of the lineup, and thus Hamilton playing and not Rob Deere. One ball and two strikes. Molitor, by the way, is expected to be back Monday or Tuesday. He has been on the disabled list since mid-June at surgery to repair a fractured knuckle in his left hand. Brewers looking forward to getting him back in the line. Curveball in the air to left field. Yvonne Calderon is back and he makes the catch for out number one. Now we mentioned he's turned into one of the best defensive left fielders in the league. That's a nice story. Sometimes a guy gets a bad rap and Calderon was a designated hitter last year. He said I want to play every day. Torborg said come to spring training and show me that you can play as well in the field and be as serious about that as you have your hitting and he's become a good all around player. He didn't do all that well in right field but he's found a niche in left for sure. 
Here's Robin Yount with one out. Yount is uh, really having his one of his worst years at the plate, batting 250. Hitting 239 at the All-Star break was his lowest in his career. Takes strike one. American League most valuable player last year. Second time he's won that award. At two different positions. Only a couple of other guys have done that. Melito Perez and the count. One this ball is, and one strike. This is another big part of Chicago's success. Look at the defensive positioning. Now they give Robin Yount the entire gap in left center, but they shade him around in the outfield toward right center. Hit in the air and out of play to right field. This is a different defensive alignment than the White Sox played last night. He had a lot bigger gap in left center field last evening against Jack McDowell. Yeah, they'll say pitch him away, play him away. Jeff Torborg doesn't believe in that. And I'm glad he doesn't. You, you play your defense according to what your pitcher pitches. Breaking ball. Still a ball and two strikes to Robin Yount. On deck will be Gary Sheffield. Most hits at age 35. And he'll turn 35 September 16th. Quite a company there, 2,693. Wow, and I mentioned the double MVP in our two different positions. The only other two guys to do it, Stan Musial and Hank Greenberg. That's pretty good company also. Two balls and two strikes to Robin Yount. Got a lot of opposite field home runs, more than anybody in the American League, and that's the reason they shade him to right center. He's had that same stroke since 1974. Another foul ball. Melito Perez is a 24-year-old promising right-hander out of San Cristobal, Dominican Republic. He was 11 and 14 last year. Led the club in wins and losses and with 31 starts in that department as well. Nobody on the 2-2 pitch breaking ball line down the left field line foul and just foul. I mentioned Nolan Ryan the only pitcher that has a better batting average against him. when Melito Perez is on his game he's right up there amongst the best. The younger brother of Pascual Perez who's had an injury plagued and uh, not quite the happiest of years for the New York Yankees. Demanding to be traded as well. Here's the 2-2 pitch. And Robin Yount continues to make Perez work here in the first inning. And you see Karkovice's target. They, when they throw the fastball inside the Yount, they better get it in there with a lot on it, or he can pull it down the left field line. But his strength with that bat position kind of cocked over his head is handling that ball out away from him. He said he's made a few minor adjustments, but that's basically the same stance and swing he had as a rookie. Something off the pitch and misses, and the count runs fully out. Three balls and two strikes. Perez five and ten at the All-Star break last year, and then he came on strong. So he proved he was a good second-half pitcher last season for the White Sox, despite finishing 29 and a half games out of first. Right out on a fastball. Yao fouled off a bunch, but Perez finally gets him in there. Two gone. Well, and even though it's just the second out of the game, it can be a big out for Melito Perez because a guy that struggles in the early going to win a battle like that against Robin Yount after he fouled off a lot of tough pitches, that really boosts your confident level. It gives you an idea of the fastball he's got through it right past Yount in his power zone. Well, with two out, here's Gary Sheffield, who's been on a tear. He has a 14-game hitting streak going right now. Takes the first pitch for a ball, second in the American League behind Ricky Henderson with a 326 average. He's got good speed, and he's got some sting in his bat as well. Fastball is in for a strike. He's been kind of an outspoken guy, and, and I think that Don Baylor, the batting coach, and Dave Parker have kind of settled Sheffield down in the clubhouse. Yeah, they've been a great end. It's amazing how players like that can have an influence, and of course, they were influenced in their career in the same way, and they can appreciate what they bring to a young player. One-two pitch, and great diving. Stopped by Ventura, the throw in time, and Robert 
Robin Ventura with a great play to set down the Brewers in order here. Well, he's just starting to hit, but the defense has been there all year. What a great play and a great draft choice by the White Sox. Their number one pick last year. Brewers nothing and the White Sox coming to bat. field will have Greg Vaughn in left, Robin Yountain center, Daryl Hamilton over and right. On the infield, it's Gary Sheffield at third, Billy Spires will play short, Jim Gantner at second, Greg Brock will be the first baseman, B.J. Surhoff is the catcher, and he'll catch left-hander Teddy Higuera. And the batting order for the White Sox, Sammy Sosa will lead off in right field, Robin Ventura, who made that outstanding play to end the first inning at third base. Yvonne Calderon is in left field. Dan Pasqua, the designated hitter. Carlos Martinez playing first base. Ron Karkovic, followed by Scott Fletcher. And Dave Gallagher in center field, and Ozzie Gee in the shortstop. And facing Teddy Higuera, who is six and five, and making his fourth attempt to win number seven. And uh, once the ace of the staff, his victory total is dropped, and Really looking for his first victory since the All-Star break. Yeah, he uh, got hit by a line drive on the knee and then pitching with it. That aggravated the groin muscle. He was on the disabled list, and he's not really been the same pitcher since coming off. But the Brewers have got to have him win a lot of games in the second half if they're going to win the American League East. Leading off for the White Sox, Sammy Sosa. Who came over from the Texas Rangers in a trade that was really criticized roundly by Chicago fans last year. Harold Baines went to Texas, but Scott Fletcher and Sosa came over along with a young promising pitcher, Wilson Alvarez, and Sosa has paid tremendous dividends already. Good speed, hitting 246. And the first pitch from Higuera, hit deep to left field, way back, and this is gone. Home run on the first pitch of the game. Sosa. And the fourth leadoff home run of the year. Let's talk about early dividends. Well, you first pitch of the game, you say, I'm probably going to get a fastball. Let me have a nice aggressive swing. And he does. Gets it out over the plate. Well, George Bell and Julio Franco are his heroes and swung an awful lot like those two guys on that swing. That put a charge in the crowd and Robin Ventura fouls off the first pitch. So Sammy Sosa, remember yesterday in batting practice, Walt Riniak, the batting instructor for the White Sox, kept a sharp eye on Sosa saying, just keep your head down, keep your head down. It's paid dividends. So Higuera stung by that home run and the count is one ball and one strike to Ventura, hitting 235, four homers and 30 runs batted in. He's moved up in the batting order from the number seven slot to the second spot. There's a strike one and two. That phrase you mentioned, keep your head down, keep your head down. When we talk about Walter Riniak's style of teaching, that is very important in his mind. Really wants the hitter to keep his head down over the ball. Breaking ball misses. Ventura went through an agonizing 0 for 41 slump this year, but Jeff Torbor kept him in the lineup. I'm not quitting on him. He's not quitting on himself, and he survived that. And that's going to bode well for the White Sox. Pop up in fair territory. Moving over is Jim Gantner. Calls off Greg Brock and makes the catch in fair territory for the first out. Uh, coming out of Oklahoma State, more of a power hitter, but he's had to adjust to the wooden bat and big league pitching. Watch the hit. Try to keep the head down, and of course, to go along with that, you try to hit the ball out in front a little bit. The danger of that long swing is the ball gets in on you, as it did there, and a harmless pop-up. One out, here's Yvonne Calderon. You mentioned his fine defensive play, but he has come through as a terrific run producer as well with 47 RBIs to lead the club. One to nothing, the White Sox lead. Sammy Sosa with a first pitch home run. Breaking ball in for a call strike. You'll see Ted Aguera. Now, when he came up to the big leagues, he was a little like Fernando. 
He's a fellow countryman, Fernando Valenzuela, had a screwball, but at the big league level, he has abandoned the screwball. Onto a slider as his principal breaking ball, and that's what Calderon fouled off. Higuera is 31 years old. His victory total has dropped considerably from the 20 victories he achieved four seasons ago. He will throw a, a lot of straight changes also. There's a fastball line down the right field line. Could be extra bases. Darrell Hamilton plays it off the wall, and Calderon will go into second, and he decoyed the defense, turned on the speed, and is in there with a triple, and backing up is Sheffield. be a three base hit for Yvonne Calderon he slowed up around second and decoyed the Brewers in the outfield well, I know it's more than halfway through the year but lest you think this White Sox team is still a surprise wrong they have really become a solid ball club and watch the way Calderon runs the bases not just taking the outside pitch the other way but aggressive base running Hamilton has to dig it out from underneath the padding in the right field wall he forces the Brewers defense which has not been good this year and it pays off. Well, the White Sox with a runner at third base and one out and Dan Pasqua the designated hitter. He's hitting 302 has not been effective against left handed pitchers getting an opportunity today. Calderon at third. First pitch is a slider for a strike. The infield is playing back except for the third baseman Sheffield. It was a step behind third. Fastball in tight, one and one. You might wonder why Pasqua's in the lineup and not Fisk or Kittle. Well, the intelligence reports, according to Jeff Torborg, show that Danny has had a lot of success against Tagera in the past, and he wants to give him a shot at it. Two balls and a strike to Pasqua, former Yankee. A home run last night to left field, opposite field, and that's a poke in this ballpark. There's the changeup, and they check with Terry Cooney, the third base umpire. It'll be a ball three and one now to Pasqua. Carlton Fisk also hit a home run last night, though he is three away from Johnny Bench's all time home run record for catchers. Fisk getting a breather today. And the count now full three and two to Dan Pasqua. Only his fourth start against the left hand pitcher this year. But of course if he gets good breaking balls like that from a probably not going to have the success he wants that fastball. Now the infield has come in all the way around with the count three balls and two strikes pitches fouled off. So the Brewers have. Drawn their infield in, trailing one to nothing, and Calderon on at third. Yeah, and Tom Treblehorn will do that with a 3 2 count because he figures if Higuera's going to throw him a breaking ball and can put it where he wants to, Pasqua's going to have a weak swing like that, make him keep Calderon at third or throw him out at home. And a natural grass field, which also helps that kind of strategy. One out, runner at third. Here's the 3 2 pitch from Higuera. And it's grounded past the second baseman, Jim Gander, for a base hit. Scoring is Calderon, and the White Sox have scored two runs here in the bottom of the first inning. And for Pasqua, his 40th RBI of the year. Wow, the pitching has been great, the defense has been great, and the scouting reports and the intelligence reports <laughs> have been right along with it because not many managers would start. A left hand hitter when you've got Fisk and Kittle on your bench to be designated hitters but Torborg made that move and it's paid off. They have meetings before every game and not just one team meeting but Jeff Torborg has his coaches with defensive meetings offensive meetings catchers pitchers even base running confabs. Here is Carlos Martinez he lifts a fly ball to right field Darrell Hamilton makes the catch Pasqua who is halfway goes back to first and there are two down here in the first inning. You know some old time baseball people might poo poo that approach that Jeff Torborg takes about you know you're, you're overthinking over coaching but when you play a game every day sometimes getting ready mentally is the toughest part and I think with the Walter Riniak work ethic and Jeff Torborg Sammy Ellis the pitching coach in your picture right there I think these guys have the White Sox in that frame of mind they are ready to play and win every game Ron Karkovice 
Catcher who only really gets a chance to play when Carlton Fisk gets a breather. First pitch is a changeup for ball one, but Karkovice, who really is in demand from other clubs around the league, is the Sox future behind the plate. Great defensive catcher and a terrific arm. Runner at first is Pascal with two out. Fastball in tight. Chin music there. Now they start taking that outside pitch the other way. You gotta protect your territory. Pitch is up high. Three balls and no strikes to Karkovice. Pasqua, who singled through the drawn in infield, knocked in the second run of this first inning for the White Sox. Three and one now. Infielders have a way of communicating with one another. They want to know who's going to cover the bag. Bill Spires relays the sign to Jim Gantner with the open mouth. Could mean I've got it or you've got it. The ooh sound, you. Curveball is in for a call strike two. Three balls in two strikes now as Karkovice steps out of the box and gives a look at Terry Bevington, the third base coach for the White Sox. Two out, and Pasqua will be running on the pitch. Swung on a miss, strike three, but the White Sox get two runs, including a leadoff homer by Sammy Sosa. We've completed one. this milestone 300 homers 2500 hits look at the great names 15 of them in the Hall of Fame Reggie Jackson Tony Perez not yet eligible and of course neither is Dave Parker who is still playing and Parker leading off having a fantastic year hitting 306 66 runs batted in amongst the league's best takes ball one a lot of people remember him the last couple of years as a designated hitter. Remember, he won back-to-back -back batting titles in the National League and was the most valuable player in 1978. Slash down the right field line foul. Parker has broken Henry Aaron's record for most homers and runs batted in in a season by a designated hitter. 39-year-old out of Jacksonville, Mississippi. Uh, maybe 39, but I've got 19-year-old wrist, doesn't he? And he has made the adjustment. You don't play that long without adjusting. More weight on the back foot, waiting on that breaking ball. 1-1 one, one pitch from Melito Perez. That was the fork ball you saw that. Here's how he gets ready, huh? Uh, Willie Stargell started a device similar to that in the Pirate days, and that's just a good old-fashioned sledgehammer to make that bat feel a little lighter. Fly ball, right center field. Gallagher and Sosa coming over, and it's going to be Gallagher, the center fielder, for the first out. That was hit very high into the air. We told you it was overcast when we started today. The sun is out, but the lights have also been turned on here at Comiskey Park. Always seems to be a haze here on the uh, south side of Chicago, a little more humid away from the lake, not the breeze. Red Sox and Orioles have early leads in their respective games. One out here is Greg Vaughn, Rookie of the Year candidate when the season began, hitting 243 with 10 homers and 43 runs batted in. Play him to pull, takes a fastball for a strike. Uh, he would be just the opposite of, say, some of the White Sox hitters with that long swing. Greg Vaughn, when he's hitting well, has a very short, compact swing, quick. And a good power hitter. Last year hit five homers, but three of them we're off the likes of Dave Stewart, Bob Welsh, and Dennis Eckersley. Pretty good company, all on the A's. One ball, one strike, one away here. Brewers batting in the top of the second inning. The White Sox are in front, two to nothing. Breaking ball, they appeal to Rick Reed, the first base umpire, but it'll be a ball, two and one. Oh, it's a little more relaxed player right now. Remember, the Brewers and the Reds made that trade, sending Glenn Braggs over to Cincinnati, and Vaughn getting a lot more playing time now. Swing and a miss on a good fastball by Perez is best so far of this game and it's two and two. Jim mentioned the key for Perez as he faces Vaughn with one out is to survive the first couple of innings. If he does he could 
be home free, and he staked to a two to nothing lead. Yeah, when you get guys out in zones that they hit the ball pretty well, which he's done to Yount, and he just threw that one past Vaughn up and away. That tells you you got good stuff, good fastball. Two two misses up high, and the count is full. On deck is Greg Brock, the Brewers' first baseman. Look at the numbers. He's a pull hitter, and you can see 51 balls hit to left field, 16 to right. Balls that are hit to the outfield. 3 2 pitch is a fastball, misses outside. And the first base runner of the game for the Brewers as Vaughn draws a walk. And he's got good speed. And that's probably why you saw most of those pitches on the outside part of the plate. Quick compact swing, a little quicker on the inside pitch than a lot of hitters. As a result, he pulled more balls this year. Here's Greg Brock hitting 251 with three homers and 37 runs batted in. We'll watch Vaughn, who averaged 25 stolen bases the last four years in the minor leagues. Infield is a double play depth. And the first pitch misses 1 0 to the former Dodger. Martinez is holding Vaughn on at first base. Field playing Brock around to the left. Setting up outside the strike zone and the throw to first base. Brewers lead the American League in stolen bases and last year became the first team since the Royals in the late 70s to lead the league for three straight seasons in that department. There you go. They got 98. Foul back. One ball, one strike. It really points up again the, the importance of pitching in defense. I mean, they lead the American League, as you said, in stolen bases. They're better than the White Sox in every offensive category, but they don't catch it and they don't pitch it as well. And you see this unusual positioning by the White Sox from hitter to hitter and how it's really paid off. They've got Brock played, Brock played over in left center field. One out, one on for Milwaukee. He jammed him in a pop up. Karkabais has a play. For the second out. Good pitch in on the fist by Melito Perez, and there are two down. Vaughn remains at first base, and that will bring up the number seven hitter in the Brewers lineup, their catcher, B.J. Serhoff, who's hitting 278. You go back to the draft of 1985 and you know, play a little trivia. The number one draft pick, Will Clark, was in the draft that year. Here's the guy. Why did they pick him over Will Clark? Because the Brewers needed a catcher. They're hard to find. He was the best player in the country that year. Now you tell me why the Cincinnati Reds picked Bernie Carbo ahead of Johnny Bench. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that year. Carbo, the former outfielder, later played with the Red Sox and other clubs. Might be one of the tougher jobs in baseball is to be a scout and try to project what kind of player a young man's going to be. But all those guys have reached the big leagues, and Surhoff's done a good job for the Brewers behind the plate. One to know the count with two down. Even with the bag at third is Robin Ventura. In for the call strike one and one. Sirhoff turns 26 a week from today. Native of the Bronx, New York. Had five homers last season. And has already matched that total. There's Greg Vaughn on at first with two away. Fastball on the inside part of the plate and a fly ball to center field. Dave Gallagher makes the catch. The Brewers leave one, and after an inning and a half, it's the White Sox, two to nothing. White Sox with the lead coming up in the last of the second inning here. And talk about that Brewer defense, you know, and it's not just the errors, it's also the plays they don't make, the extra outs they give teams that aren't even charged as errors. Scott Fletcher leading off the second baseman, bottom third of the order for the White Sox against Teddy Higuera, and the first pitch is a strike. Fletcher, who came over from the Rangers last year, been a terrific player, a pesky hitter, but he's hitting 333 against Milwaukee pitching, the best of any of the White Sox starters today. Will be followed by Dave Gallagher and Ozzie Guillen. Curve ball hit out to left field. Coming in is Vaughn, and he's there to make the catch, and there's one out. 
quite a change, quite a contrast in the two ball clubs, really. The Brewers are mainly a, a club made up of draft choices from their own organization, the White Sox. Scott Fletcher is an example of that being acquired from Texas. Have really put together a team that they've acquired mainly through good trades. Got Fletcher and Sosa for Harold Baines. Dave Gallagher getting a chance today, hitting 279. One out, last of the second inning. Fastball up and away. Last year, Gallagher was the only White Sox player to appear in every game. Spent eight years in the minor leagues. Bunts the ball back and out of play in the count one, one, and one. Yeah, there's another acquisition. He's one of those six-year minor league free agents. He came up with the Cleveland organization. The White Sox picked him up and He's been a good find, though Lance Johnson is primarily the center fielder this year, especially against right-hand pitching. Big question for the White Sox, do they have sufficient starting pitching to challenge Oakland this year? Swung on and missed, strike two, one ball and two strikes. Boy, example of that swing right there. Once again, we're looking at Jeff Torborg in that picture, but the Walter Iniac style and that top hand coming off the bat, really what he emphasizes along with that is the high finish and the follow through. That's just kind of the byproduct of a good full swing. Higuera with the one two pitch in on the fist, grounded a shortstop. Bill Spires up with it, then there are two away. Right now, for an update, let's check in with Greg Gumbel in New York. Greg? Well, Dick, at Detroit, the Red Sox brought their hitting shoes to Tiger Stadium. They jumped all over Frank Tanana for five runs in the first inning. This RBI double by Tim Nering gets Jody Reed home. Frank Tanana out, Clay Parker in, and the Red Sox have a five-run lead in the first. Dick? All right, Greg, and with two away, here is one of the more exciting players. You want to talk about reasons why the White Sox have had a dramatic turnaround. How about Ozzie Guillen, who's leading the club with a 306 batting average, and that's only part of the story. Third baseman Sheffield is playing in. Guillen takes ball one. Well, you go back in the White Sox history, they have had some great shortstops. Venezuelans, Chico Carrascal, Louis Aparicio was rookie of the year in 56, and then Ozzy. Curveball in for the strike. One and one. Guillen is hitting 440. We told you how well Fletcher is hitting against Milwaukee pitching, but Guillen 440 against Aguera. Yeah, there's a couple of switch hitters and some right-hand hitters there, but lefties have had a pretty good success against Aguera this year. Way out ahead of that off-speed pitch, and the count, a ball and two strikes. And one of the reasons Aguera could have success against left-hand hitters is that pitch right there. I mean, I don't care how good a hitter you are, you're not going to hit a good breaking ball in the outside part of the plate from a lefty. There it is again, and a half swing, comebacker, and a 1-2-3 inning for Higuera. So after two innings, Sonny Kaminsky Park, the White Sox lead it 2-0. The White Sox leading the Brewers 2-0. We go to the top of the third inning, and Jim Gantner, 36-year-old veteran who's been fighting off injuries, second baseman, hitting in the number eight slot today for Milwaukee. Hitting 237, well below his lifetime average of 275. Melito Perez, first pitch breaks inside, 1 0. Yeah, getting him back in the lineup helps him in the field at second base, but they have to have Gantner, Yount, and Molitor, that original three that have played together since the late 70s. They've got to have them all in the lineup at the same time. Fastball in tight, and the look that Gantner gave Higuera, or Alito Perez speaks volumes. Yeah, Jimmy Gantner's an aggressive player, and he'll try to get the ball up and in on him as you see this pitch, and he doesn't back down from anybody. Three balls and no strikes now to Jim Gantner, who was knocked out last August. Season-ending knee injury. Roll blocked by Yankee rookie Marcus Lawton. Attempting to break up a double play, but Gantner walks on four pitches to start the third inning. That's the second walk issued by Perez. Going out to the mound is Ron Karkabais. And usually the White Sox feel like if they get Perez through the first two, and now he's facing the bottom of the order, they're in pretty good shape. He loses the number eight hitter. We're at Comiskey Park in Chicago. 
in the last Saturday of July. Dick Stockton and Jim Cott. White Sox who trail the Oakland A's by two and a half games. Lead the Milwaukee Brewers two to nothing. That's the way it looks from the picnic area where the fans are in the left field wall section. Here's Bill Spires, the shortstop, hitting in ninth today. Playing in at third is Robin Ventura. The pitch is slapped to second base. Fletcher over to Guillen for one. The return in time for the double play. Six to three, and there are two down. Now Perez makes the pitch, and then Fletcher. Now it's just a little thing, but watch the pivot in position to make the accurate throw to Guillen, and the rest is kind of automatic, and it doesn't hurt to have a six foot five inch first baseman like Martinez stretching out to catch the throw. Remember Fox and Aparicio? That was the outstanding yeah. double play combo for the 59 Go Go Sox. This club not quite out of that mold, but not far away either. Yeah, they'll scrap for runs, don't score a lot of runs, and have to depend on pitching. Of course, those go-go socks had veterans like Early Wynn and Buck Shaw, Bob Shaw. These guys have youngsters. Darrell Hamilton fly to left his first time up, takes a strike on the outside edge. That picnic area, I doubt there's another park in baseball. You can sit down at a picnic table, you know, right behind the left fielder and watch the game at the same time. You're enjoying your meal. Strike pitch foul out. Chris, you never had a chance to do it. What was it like at Comiskey Park when you played here in the 70s under Chuck Tanner? Well, that, those days were great. Even going back to coming in here the early days with the Washington Senators, this has always been a special park because you mentioned things like the, the picnic area. What was special during the 70s, of course, was having a guy named Richard Anthony Allen on my ball club and watching him play. 0-2 pitch in the dirt. Bill Melton and Allen really yeah. put a charge back in the White Sox who had been dormant for a long time in that time. Ken Henderson came along Wilbur Wood. I think the other unique things about uh, White Sox Park was Bill Beck put the first uh, exploding scoreboard out there the uh, the home plate duster the little machine behind home plate the umpires could use that started right here they don't use it anymore. I think the White Sox have had enough changes in uniforms over the years and, uh, <laughs> and we can look forward to another one again next year. Two down, nobody on base. The one-two pitch to Hamilton. On the corner for call strike three. And we'll return to Comiskey Park after this word from your local station. Sox have scored more first inning runs than any team in the American League, and this is one reason why Sammy Sosa gets a nice fastball. First pitch that Higuera throws, hits it into the left field seats. Another in a long line of great players from San Pedro to Macaris in the Dominican Republic. And coming up for the second time in the game, now with nine homers on the year, Teddy Higuera. First pitch, fastball for a strike. Sosa was with five different teams in both the majors and the minors last year. Of course, Texas was the team he was with, along with the White Sox. Been a wild free swinger. Few walks and a lot of strikeouts. This is history. Good selection there as he takes the ball one and one. You know, we mentioned Julio Franco and George Bell are his heroes. He has a lot of the mannerisms at the plate of Cesar Cedeno. You know, pounding on the bat after each pitch, grabbing a hold of it. Up is fouled out of play and then count is one and two. Deguerra dropped to nine and six last year with 22 starts. Over the first five years, he's had the best second half winning percentage in the American League, so hopes that that is an indication again, although after the All-Star game, he still hasn't found the niche. Yeah, he's a very competitive guy and, and a very sensitive one that needs a manager that will instill some confidence in him, and he struggled here, and he's He'd kind of like Tom Treblehorn to show a little more confidence in him. Treblehorn, on the other hand, I'm sure would like to see a couple solid outings. Change up, grounded. Down the left field line, past Sheffield's diving attempt. Sosa on his way to second. Vaughn's throw. And in, in, with a double is Sosa, who's two for two today with a homer and a double. It's a two base hit, but this is another example. Gary Sheffield started out as a shortstop. Now you see him, he's got good speed, takes a couple of dives right there, and that ball gets by him. And the left 
fielder's angle right there chases it down. See, there's a ball that it shouldn't, maybe should have, not should have been caught, but could have been caught by Gary Sheffield or by a, a little more, a little better third baseman. And he wasn't playing that far off the bag either. Yeah, and you might say, well, that's being kind of harsh on him, but these guys are big leaguers, and if you're going to win pennants, you, you got to make those kind of plays. So here's Robin Ventura, who popped up to Jim Gander his first time up, and he may be looking to hit the ball to the right side to advance Sosa to third with Yvonne Calderon and Dan Pasqua to follow. White Sox already with a 2 to nothing lead. Nobody out. player of the decade in the 80s with his fine play at Oklahoma State and a 58 game hitting streak as a sophomore of note. Spires trying to keep Sosa close to second. There's the bunt attempt and it's fouled back and the count 0 and 2. And Robin Ventura a couple of options there. You see him trying to drag the bunt or push the bunt down towards Sheffield. Anything he can do to advance Sosa and one of the reasons he's hitting in the number two spot Jeff Torborg feels like he's a guy that can pull the ball in these situations and advance the runner. Now with two strikes. Now you're kind of at the mercy of where the pitcher throws the ball. You can't try to try to do too much when you're an 0 and 2 count. Not much of a lead for Sosa and a bluff to second base. Sox two and a half behind the A's. They had lost four games last weekend to the Orioles. And the pitch is just low one and two. And for those people ready to count the White Sox out. Of course, earlier in the year, the White Sox lost three out of four at home to the A's and then went out and uh, or, or was swept at home and then took three out of four on the road. So they're a pesky team and they won't go away, apparently. Is outside. Uh, Gander, the second baseman that time, was moving over to perhaps cover second. Yeah, you see the good discipline right there by Ventura. Higuera would like to see him chase that outside breaking ball. Ventura trying to wait for something that he can at least hit a ground ball to the right side. Two balls and two strikes. And a fastball on the corner for a strike three, and Higuera could not have pitched Ventura any better. One away right now. Let's check in again with Greg Gumbel. Greg? Well, Dick, at Detroit, Boston hit Detroit with five in the top of the first. The Tigers came back with three of their own in the bottom of the first on Larry Sheets' three-run homer. They are now in the second inning, and Detroit is pulled to within two. It's five to three Red Sox. Dick? That's a great race, Greg. Uh, Toronto has a one-game lead, but so many clubs are in the hunt there. As we said, Milwaukee, 52 losses. Six losses behind Toronto, and they're in sixth place. Throw to second on the pickoff attempt close. Covering was Gantner, and getting back is Sammy Sosa. Uh, you mentioned that Gantner had been breaking toward the bag, and that's a timing play. The shortstop Spires will make a couple of moves toward the bag and then move back into position to try to get Sosa's attention, and Gantner moved right in behind him. There's the changeup up high on the count. 1 0. Oh. Calderon tripled to the opposite field his first time up and came around and scored on Dan Pasqua's base hit for the second Chicago run in the opening inning. Ventura struck out. Sosa is a threat to steal third base. The Brewers lead the American League in stealing, but the White Sox are also a base stealing ball club, but their percentage is down. They get thrown out more than any team in the American League. They've stolen 88, but they've been caught 60 times. That's not very good. Well, wait a second. We're going to call them the Go Go Sox, even if yeah, they're caught more right. than they should be. Right? Well, I think what that tells you, the numbers are really insignificant but what that tells you is that Jeff Torborg wants to play an aggressive style of baseball even if you do get thrown out on occasion makes the other team think two balls and no strikes change up and a big swing by Calderon and it's two and one Calderon broke in with the Seattle Mariners this is his fourth year 
with Chicago and broke in with the Mariners along with a lot of other great young players that have gone on to bigger and better things. Sometimes we forget about it. Dave Henderson started with the Seattle Mariners. Right. Dan Higuera steps off and will go to the rosin bag. Sammy Sosa, who's two for two with a homer and a double. White Sox trying to add to their two to nothing lead here in the bottom of the third inning at Comiskey Park. Great change and a pop-up changing and chasing it is Surhoff and it'll be out of play. Now you see Calderon stance and look at that front foot kind of pigeon toed in toward the back and of course to be a good hitter they talk often about keeping the front side closed don't let it fly open like he eventually did right there in the changeup but by towing in that front foot it kind of helps a hitter to not only keep his weight back but keep that front side closed. You see some of them with the weight right way up on the toe. A lot of the hitters these days will put the weight way up on the toe. Calderon doesn't do that. Two balls and two strikes to count to Calderon. There you see in the top of Comiskey Park, the old one, the new one. That'll be ready next year. And it's kind of modeled after this one as far as the fact that it's going to be a pitcher's ballpark, natural grass. You don't put together a team and form it and then change the dimensions of the park. Here's the 2-2 pitch, and there goes Sosa attempting to steal third, and he's going to be in there. He got a great jump, and that's his 18th stolen base of the year. Now you force the other team, and especially when they're a team like the Brewers that struggles in the field, you force them to make the play. Look at those that great acceleration by Sosa, and in his haste to make the throw, Surhoff lost control of the ball. Sosa gets in there without a play. So with one out, White Sox have a runner 90 feet from home and the count to call their own three and two and there's a ground ball up the middle base hit. Sosa will score. Calderon drives in his 48th run of the year and the White Sox now in front of the Brewers three to nothing. That's the aggressive style that Jeff Torborg has imprinted on the White Sox this year. Yeah what you can really see in all phases of the game for the White Sox is the approach they take. Mention that they come out ready to play. There's a breaking ball away that Calderon went out and got. Hereniak will spend some time with these guys before the game and say, this is the way he likes to work certain hitters. I mean, you can really sense how this ball club has their head into every phase of the ball game. Even the guys in the bench and in the on-deck circle are kind of shouting out encouragement and pointing out little instructions to the guys on the bases. And a young team, as you mentioned, the youngest pitching staff, they get any kind of results from their starters and they really haven't had a number one stopper so to speak they've used five starters with great middle relief particularly Barry Jones and of course uh, Bobby Thickpan who's been the best relief pitcher in baseball Dan Pasqua takes strike one now Calderon is on at first base you talk to him now everyone has been calling him Pasqua but of course that's not quite the pronunciation well he wants. players don't want to get too hung up on uh, it used to be the same thing with Mike Pagliarulo or Pagliarulo, but Danny said it's it's really Pasqua, but a lot of people say Pasqua. There goes the runner, Calderon, the throw to second base, not in time. He had it beat even before Spires dropped the throw. And Calderon, who leads the White Sox now with his 27th stolen base of the year. Boy, when you've got a threat like this in your lineup that's playing good defense, they all have that good speed. And once again, I mean, they really have the Brewers on the run right now. You can sense it. They're going to take advantage of, of every opportunity. You even have to be conscious of him trying to steal third. We have bullpen activity has begun in the Brewers sector of the park. Pasqua swings and misses. And the count of ball and two strikes. On deck is Carlos Martinez, the White Sox, who scored two in the first. Already have a run here and threatening with one out. With a runner in scoring position. Jamie Navarro warming up for the Brewers. One two pitch check swing and the count is even two and two. Higuera one and four since coming off the disabled list June 29th and there is Navarro in the bullpen. Yeah, Higuera is just the opposite of Perez. I mean he has had a lot of success in the early innings this year. But not today. Field and outfield straight away for Pasqua. 
Three balls and two strikes now to the White Sox designated hitter batting cleanup today. When you look at Carl Fisk, Ron Kittle, Lance Johnson getting a rest today. It's a good sign for Chicago. Swing and a miss, took something off the pitch, and Pasco goes down. That is the third strikeout of the game for Teddy Higuera. Well, he got burned on a 3-2 fastball the last time, so Aguera says he's going to hit my off-speed pitch or breaking ball this time, and that's a good breaking ball right there that Pasqua swings through. Two down, called her own, still at second base, and here's Carlos Martinez, who flied out to Darrell Hamilton in right field his first time. Fastball grounded at third, Sheffield backhands it. And the side is out, but the White Sox get another run and stole two bases in the inning. And after three, it's three to nothing, Chicago. We've completed three innings here at Comiskey Park in Chicago. The White Sox lead it. Sammy Sosa on the first pitch of the game gave them immediate one nothing lead. Yvonne Calderon has a triple and a single and an RBI. And Melito Perez has pitched three solid innings. And of course, he you know, may be out of that danger zone of the early innings that always spell whether he's going to make it or not. If the uh, past history, you know, you past history tells you what happened. It doesn't tell you what's going to happen today. But he certainly is a, a better pitcher when he gets through those first two. Robin Yount up for the second time takes ball one. So the totals after three, the White Sox three runs, five hits and no errors. And Milwaukee nothing across. They've had two base runners, both by virtue of walks. And a call strike one and one. We'll talk about all the numbers that Robin Yount has piled up. But you know the impressive thing to me about him, he has played since coming up in 1974 over 90 percent of the games that he was eligible to play in. And you can't tell me that he feels 100 percent every time he comes to the ballpark. He's had some shoulder surgery, spent just a, a short time on the disabled list. But talk about durability. There you see it. Al Ripken, Tony Fernandez, the only other players in the league who have started every game. Fastball in for the strike. One, two balls and two strikes now to Yount. Perez has struck out two and walked two. Yount, of course, has played but has not really been in the groove at all this year. Brewers sorely would love to see him come around and he takes a call third strike and goes down for the second time. Now Robin doesn't like to call. Either he doesn't like to call or he just thought maybe he was going to get a pitch a little closer to the inside part of the plate. But Tim Cheetah rings him up and a little animation by Perez. You can see him getting into his game and his control getting sharper. One away third strike out of the game for Perez and here's Gary Sheffield. Sheffield was robbed of a base hit by Robin Ventura who made a fine diving stab to his left in the first inning. Ball one high and inside. Did he go around? Yes he did. Rick Reed first base umpire indicates that Sheffield could not hold back his swing. Now most of the time when you see it again they did because it's so hard to hold that bat up. That's questionable but it's not whether the wrists break in the umpire's mind. It's did the barrel of the bat go through the hitting area and that was a tough call. Sheffield Tampa Florida the nephew of Mets pitcher Doc Gooden looks at a breaking ball and the count one ball one strike. Remember I mentioned that Richard Anthony Allen Dick Allen performed so well here MVP 1972 Sheffield's bat position not quite like Richie's but very close. Fastball hit in the air deep to left field Calderon going back looking up and it's gone in the upper deck. Home run for Gary Sheffield. And the first hit off of Melito Perez. And it's a home run for Sheffield, his seventh of the year, and it's a three to one ball game. White Sox. And the reason I mentioned that Dick Allen bat position, when you can point the barrel of the bat out toward the pitcher, as Sheffield does right here. And then still unload and uncock the wrists. Watch how quickly that bat hit gets through the hitting area. And there's a guy who not only with that kind of power, but a threat to win the batting title this year. Second in the league coming in. And talk about threats to hit the long ball. Here's Dave Parker. 
Parker looks at ball one. He fly to center his first time up. And with that home run by Sheffield, he extended his hitting streak to 15 games. Check swing and foul back. One and one now to Parker. Kevin Seitzer of the Kansas City Royals. They haven't had a lot of bright spots, but he has the longest streak in the American League this year at 17. Brian Harper of the Minnesota Twins hitting last night has 16. So it looks like they both with an excellent chance to pass that up. This is the way the White Sox play Dave Parker. The shift in the infield. Shortstop Guillen, not quite behind second base, but notice how deep those infielders are playing. Really seeing a lot more imaginative defenses in baseball these days. On deck is Greg Vaughn. Foul ball. Parkabais gives chase, but it'll be out of play. And if people might want White Sox have a coach Joe Nasik. Now he can only keep five in uniform. Nasik comes up to the press box and they will chart where every ball is hit off every pitcher and they feed him into a computer as you might expect in today's times. And eventually they find out where a guy hits the ball off certain pitchers set their defense accordingly. No more of the step to pull shade him the other way type of stuff. Ball and two strikes to Parker. Fly ball left center field. Gallagher with the glasses down. He makes the catch. And there are two away. Two down in the Brewers' fourth inning. The White Sox, who are even in the lost column with the Oakland A's, are leading three to one. Sheffield with the home run with one out to put Milwaukee on the scoreboard. And here's Greg Vaughn, who drew a pass his first time up. You know, players get their satisfaction from seeing the wins in a ball game or doing well on the field, but when you see those kind of plays and the players position properly, then the coaches get satisfaction. One and note of Vaughn. Oakland playing a doubleheader at Minnesota starting later on. Stewart and Welsh will be on the mound for the A's in that one. Broken back ground ball to Scott Fletcher at second base. Makes the play to the retire the side. Sheffield's home run makes it a three to one game. White Sox. Jim, people have been amazed that the White Sox have hung in with the A's as well as they have so far this season. And the question is, uh, will that bullpen run out? I mean, he goes to the bullpen a lot, Torbor. Well, he goes to the bullpen a lot more than any team in the American League. But innings-wise, they have not pitched as many innings as a lot of bullpen. So I think that Jeff Torbor used that bullpen very, very well. And that's what's got him two and a half games out. Ron Karkovice leading off here. Off-speed breaking ball popped up. Serha makes the catch and there's one out in the White Sox fourth inning. Now the trading deadline is going to be Tuesday as we know and there have been a lot of rumors that the White Sox might be interested in Mike Scott from Houston although I don't know if that'll happen because of the uh, price tag on Scott and, and what they'd have to give up maybe another pitcher without all the credentials maybe fit in better with the White Sox. I think so I don't think they're going to mortgage their future and take some of the things that they've done and just throw it away to get a veteran pitcher they've got a young phenom at double A ball right now and I don't know that he's ready to pitch in the big leagues kind of like a Ben McDonald but it's Alex Fernandez and don't be surprised to see him up here next week product of the University of Miami Scott Fletcher with one out in the fourth inning fastball popped up to short right field Darrell Hamilton moving in and making the catch for the second out of course with double headers coming up uh, Fernandez may be the guy they bring up, and you may be right about that. Coming up next, the Buick Open. After two rounds, a close battle, Hale Irwin and Don Pooley tied for the lead. And look at that familiar name again. Every time Hale, Ner Hale Irwin's name is up there, Mike Donald is down there. Might be nice to see him win one. Donald and Irwin, what a dramatic 19th hole they had huh, for the U.S. Open. Right here in this city. That's right, Adina. I mentioned that Alex Fernandez you know there's more than just age we talk about young pitchers but everyone matures at a little different time and there's a, a guy in his early 20s that's a very mature 21 year old sometimes the age and the experience get mixed up we talk about young players like the White Sox pitchers they're 24 25 that's not really young by big league standards but a lot of them are inexperienced pitchers fastball on the 2 0 pitch to Gallagher and it's two and one. Teddy Higuera has allowed three runs on five hits. He has struck out three, has not walked about it. 
And the count now, two and two to Gallagher with two out here in the fourth inning. Back surgery last January. Home spur. All those injuries as a result of that initial problem. Breaking ball hit in the air to left center field. Vaughn calls for it, and left center makes the catch in a 1-2-3 inning for Aguera. Only the second time in four innings. CBS Sports presents Major League Baseball. Today's game is brought to you by Toyota's quality line of cars and trucks. Toyota, I love what you do for me. The Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. And by Diet Pepsi, the right one. And there it is, the new Comiskey Park that will open. Construction will be ready. And it'll be a park that I'm sure that the White Sox fans will enjoy, although that uh, a lot of the memories die hard here. A lot of people didn't want to see this park left. and uh, But, you know, this has been an old park, been refurbished several times, the oldest park in the big leagues, 80 years old. Top of the fifth inning, Greg Brock lines the first pitch out of play for a strike. Brock fouled out to Ron Karkabais, the White Sox catcher, his first time up, and has been a successful hitter in daytime, hitting over 300. Paul Molitor ready to come off the disabled list, and the rumor is that he may play first base, but hey, this guy's hitting well right now. Going to be hard to move him out of there. Up high. Every infielder has their own little way of getting ready to get themselves in position lest the ball be hit toward them. And there's Scotty Fletcher's little hop, step, and a jump. Fast ball that Perez gets up, and it's fouled out of play. But Brock is showing a good stroke right now, and he is right on Melito Perez fastball. Quick on the fastball. You mentioned that Scott Fletcher. I'm glad I never had to face him. When I was with the Cardinals in the early 80s, he was a member of the Chicago Cubs. Of course, you play all or mostly day ball over in Wrigley Field. shots in this ballpark and this is a pitcher's park not easy to hit home runs B.J. Serhoff there's Sosa going as high as he could go foul off for a strike and I mentioned that Scott Fletcher I came out early one morning at Wrigley Field I was going to warm up take my warm up tosses I didn't have any baseballs and I saw this kid standing by the dugout I said son will you go get me a couple of baseballs and he did brought him back to me in the eighth inning, he came in to play second base <laughs> for the Cubs. I looked out. I said, I thought that was the bat boy. And I, we've shared that story, and he laughs at it. I said, I'm glad I never had to face you. He wanted to take a line drive off my shin. He could have had a different response at the time. <laughs> yes. 1-1 one, one pitch. Serhoff. Bounce to Carlos Martinez. Makes the play unassisted, and there's one away. But the Milwaukee long ball has put him back in this game. They were trailing 3 to nothing. But home runs by Gary Sheffield last inning and Greg Brock to lead off here in the fifth have cut the White Sox lead to three to two. And that'll bring up Jim Ganter who walked his first time up. Ventura playing in on the grass at third line drive to center field Gallagher moving over makes the catch for the second out. I don't know if Jeff Torborg and Sammy Ellis his pitching coach will pay attention to the way the Brewers are hitting the ball but it's obvious the last couple innings that the pitchers are up and they're stinging it pretty good and oftentimes even though a pitcher is getting guys out that will cause them to get that bullpen ready a little quicker. I think Sammy Ellis and bullpen coach Barry Foote as well as Dave LaRoche deserve a lot of credit also. Walter Reniak has been credited for the hitters but these guys Ellis with the starters LaRoche with the relievers and Barry Foote down the bullpen have done a great job working not only the mechanical part of pitching but the mental part of it with this entire staff. 
Here's Bill Spires bounced into a double play his first time up. Speaking of the mechanical part of it, Sammy Ellis telling us yesterday about Perez and the problem that he has in the tempo around the rubber when he's delivering. Yeah, at 6-4, you know, you, you try to show that hitter your hip pocket. You want to make a nice turn and then drive toward the target. And sometimes Perez turns too much. Sometimes he doesn't turn enough. Gets a little out of rhythm. That's low, one and one. That's a constant problem for tall pitchers. You used to kind of stand on the rubber and practice almost like a ballet dancer. Just practice standing on one leg to get that balance point, which is so important. Two down, the bases are clear. Pitch is in time. Let's get a close look at what he does here. Yeah, see, when, they, when the hitter shows you his hip pocket, you show him yours. And there's that high leg kick, balance point, front foot pointed toward the target. And you see by the fingers being spread right there, that was the change up for the fork ball as he released it. Two balls and a strike. He jams, spires, and a pop-up. Shortstop Guillen is there, makes the play, but a leadoff homer by Greg Brock, and the Brewers inch closer, trailing 3-2 after four and a half. This copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. Three to two, the White Sox hitting in the fifth inning. Ozzie Guillen, the number nine hitter, who on a half swing bounced back to Higuera his first time up. Higuera now trailing by a run. There's a strike. Carlton Fist said he has never known a player ever in his career who has combined the talent with a zest for life as Ozzie Guillen displays. Yeah, a lot of people wonder from a baseball standpoint why he's hitting ninth, but here he's a leadoff hitter. He's really a second leadoff hitter in that nine hole. In the air to left center field, Robin Yount, one away. Well, let's check on what's going on around the major leagues with Greg Gumbel in New York. Greg? Well, Dick, at Detroit, we don't know the extent of the injury, but Red Sox starter Mike Boddicker hurts his right elbow on that pitch. He has left the game, and the Red Sox in a pennant race can ill afford to lose pitching. Boddicker sitting on 11 victories right now. 6-4 Boston, third inning, Dick. You know, that's a tough break because a lot of people feel that the one thing the Red Sox need before the trading deadline is pitching. They picked up Mike Marshall from the Mets. Boddicker is out. That's really going to put a big crimp in their plans. Here's Sammy Sosa. Swings and misses on a sharp breaking ball. Sosa with a leadoff home run today on the first pitch and a double two for two. Yeah, that's not Mike Marshall, the pitcher, so they're going to get some, <laughs> that's right. some hitting help there, but that might be your Mike Scott story. Something like that happens. That's when those trades are made at the last minute, the last hour. One away here in the White Sox fifth. Breaking ball in tight, one and one. You know, Roger Clemens may be enough for most clubs. Boddicker has been a tremendous boost for the Red Sox. Boy, and they've gotten good mileage also out of guys like Tom Bolton and Dana Kicker, Greg Harris. Ground ball, diving stop by Sheffield. And Sosa with good speed is just out by a half a step. Speaking of the Tigers, Walt Terrell was signed by them, but here's Sheffield with a fine play. Well, I take it all back, Gary Sheffield. There's a ball hit to his backhand, and really from up here looked like he could have had, but there's a ball that really he should not have made. I mean, that's a great play, and it, it just gives you an idea of the athletic skill, and that's all it is. It's reflexes, dive, catch the ball, and bounce up and make an accurate throw. You don't practice those in spring training. You just react to them. So they're two down to Robin Ventura. Takes an off-speed pitch for a strike. Ventura is 0 for 2. In 278, in double A last year, It's sharply to center field, but right at Robin Yount. A 1-2-3 inning, so Teddy Higuera has settled down. He is retired eight in a row. Now the A's have played five more games than the White Sox and have won them all. They're even in the loss column. Yeah, that's that all-important column, and the A's with a big doubleheader tonight in Minnesota. Minnesota's down near the bottom, but Tony La Russa has great respect, and I think sometimes a little fear of that ball club in that ballpark. Ken Herbeck and Puckett and Gaetti. Beer well-founded, having lost two games 
in a row to the Twins. He had double headers. The, the old saying in baseball, they're they're hard to win and easy to lose. Most of the time you split. So if the White Sox win here, they figure to pick up at least a half a game. Darrell Hamilton, the leadoff hitter, third time around for the Brewers. Looks at a fastball inside. One ball and one strike. It'll be Hamilton, Yount, and Sheffield here in the sixth inning. Outfield playing around on the left. And a line drive down the right field line. Well, they did not play him exactly well in the field. Hamilton with good speed on his way to second and will all of a sudden put on the brakes and settle for a double. But the Brewers here in the sixth have the tying run in scoring position. Daryl Hamilton at the top of the order for this reason. Get on base. Watch the breaking ball. Breaking balls down and in from right-hand pitchers to left-hand hitters are right in that joy zone. You drop the barrel of the bat on the ball. Hamilton took advantage of it. You know, it's much more important for the White Sox to score first, and they do it very often to turn it over to their bullpen. But the Brewers are a team that can give up a few runs, and they have the firepower to come back much more so than the White Sox do. Treble Horns Brewers battling back in this one. Here's Robin Yao, who has struck out twice, once on a called third strike. Bunts down the first baseline, a good bunt, and Perez can't make the play, and everybody's safe. Here's another example of the great athletic skills of Robin Yao. Yeah, some baseball people might say, what's he doing, bunting him? Guy making that kind of money, an MVP ought to be swinging the bat. He's making a statement right here. We're down three to two, it's the middle of the game. I want to get that tie and run to third base. And not only does he get it to third, but Perez's mistake, the Brewers have a chance now to take the lead. It'll be a sacrifice and an error charge to Perez. First error of the ball game, and so Robin Yount is on at first base. Sammy Ellis out to the mound to talk to Perez, and we have double barrel action. Ken Patterson and Don Paul are warming up in the bullpen. Patterson, the lefty, also has been used to start on occasion uh, back in his days with the Yankee chain. And Don Paul, a number, another of those pitchers with the good fork ball and split finger fastball. He throws a bolt, a hard splitter, and a good off-speed fork ball. You know, Jeff Torborg has not hesitated to go to his long relief even when the starting pitchers have been pitching even better than Perez has. This has been his pattern this year. And Perez has kind of weakened in the last uh, three innings or so. And wouldn't be surprised if the has some problems here. He comes out of the game. Here's Gary Sheffield who homered in the fourth inning to account for the first Milwaukee run. Runners at first and third. Still nobody out. Did he go around? They appeal the first. No. Ball one. Well, Sheffield pulled the home run, and that's what the White Sox think that he'll do most of the time. Guillen way over in the hole and Gallagher way over in the left center field. Big gap in right center. Dave Parker on deck for the Brewers. Setting up away from the plate. Fastball is just low. And the count two balls and no strikes. Talk about pitching changes. Well, they're on track for an, uh, a record here set by the Reds and A's in their respective leagues. Of course, don't be confused by those numbers and say, well, they're overusing their bullpen. They make a lot of changes, but they got five guys down there. You know, an inning here, two-thirds there, so I don't think they're at the burnout stage. Here's the 2-0 pitch. Misses again, and it's 3-0 to Sheffield. So Perez is one pitch away from loading the bases with nobody out, and Dave Parker... So Patterson, the left-hander, may be working in earnest with the left-handed hitter due on deck. Interesting decision for Tom Treblehorn. Parker's on deck, but you might green light Sheffield the way he's been hitting on 3-0. Fastball taking all the way for a strike, 3-1. Checking with Duffy Dyer, the third base coach. There's Dave Parker. First base coach is Andy Echebarren. Belito Perez trying to Pitch out of his first real jam of the afternoon. White Sox lead three to two, but Darrell Hamilton is the tying run at third. Robin Yount, the runner at first. The runner at first, Yount goes base hit to center field by Sheffield. Scoring is Hamilton to tie the game, and Robin Yount, who is running, goes all the way to third, and we have a new ball game. Well, the 
Raiders don't always cooperate with that defensive positioning. That ball's out away from Sheffield, but on the hit and run, he's got one responsibility. Put the bat on the ball. He didn't try to drive that pitch. That was a case there where the White Sox defense might have been in a hit, you know, in that type of situation, might have been better off straight away. But you can't make those kind of changes and decisions right on the spur of the moment. You live with what you started the game with. Jeff Torborg has come out to the mound, and that'll be all for Melito Perez. Ken Patterson, the left-hander, will be coming in to face the left-handed hitting Dave Parker. So the complexion of this game has changed totally. This relief break is sponsored by Rollades. And a new pitcher for the White Sox is left-hander Ken Patterson, who's making his 25th appearance all in relief. His record is 2-1, and one, an earn run average of 3.88 has one save this year obtained from the Yankees farm system back in 1987. Another example of the White Sox tapping that Yankee system as well as many others to build this ball club and Patterson's job here with a better than average fastball and good curveball is to get out Parker and then maybe toward the end of the inning Greg Brock a couple lefties. Here's some other top relievers. Big pen that we could see in this game Dennis Eckersley Frank Owen Myers people in the National League. So here is Dave Parker who fly to center field twice against Perez. Left handed Patterson in there. Runners are at first and third and swinging at the first pitch and a pop up Parker Weiss. Parker trying to get out of the way. Not sure where the ball is but Parker Weiss makes the catch and Patterson gets Parker on one pitch. see Parker frustrated by that at bat. I think he had what he thought was a hitter's pitch and he popped it straight up. Kind of gets in the way of Carlos Martinez and with this hazy sunshine today the ball a little difficult to pick up. Karkovice puts it away. Greg Vaughn the batter taking a long look at third base coach Duffy Dyer. With one out there's Dyer Robin Yount on at third base. Vaughn has walked and bounced out. Trying to pitch the White Sox out of a jam here. They were in front three to nothing at one time, and the score is now tied three three. And funny, everyone talked about how Melito Perez had his problems in the early innings, got by those, and then struggled yeah. in the middle. Well, that's the interesting thing about this game. You look at the numbers and the tendencies, and you say this is probably what will happen, but you never know. As Joaquin Andahar said, you can sum it up in one word: you never know. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Foul back off the fastball, and the count is one and one to Greg Vaughn. Guy becomes a factor right now in the Brewers lineup should Patterson get Vaughn out is Rob Deere didn't start today. He's got the biggest I guess you could say disparity between his average against lefties and he's about a 340 hitter against lefties against righties is why he's not in the lineup today. It's only about a buck 40 so Treblehorn could run him off the bench against Patterson but then he might have to face Paul. Rob Deere leads the Brewers with 17 home runs. One one pitch good fastball again by Patterson 26 year old native of Costa Mesa California. Now here's Ozzie Guillen communicating with Scott Fletcher. I've got it. I've got it in case the runner goes you hold your ground. And of course the White Sox infield back now at double play depth with a chance to get out of this inning. expand the strike zone Patterson with a good live fastball upstairs gets on to chase it back Patterson is a pitcher that eventually could work his way into this rotation here with the White Sox. The park of ice going out to the mound a pat on the back for Ken Patterson and that'll bring up Greg Brock who slashed a home run leading off the fifth inning first two hits of the game for the Brewers were home runs by Sheffield and Brock to cut the lead to three to two here. They put together a double, a single, and an error by Perez, who has since departed. There goes Sheffield, and he'll steal the throw to third base. Getting back in time is Young. He took off just enough of a lead so that Karkovic did not throw to second base, got back safely, and a stolen base for Gary Sheffield. 
three three game the important run is at third base so you say why would Sheffield take the gamble well he got a good jump he has great speed now of course it eliminates say a ground ball being hit toward Guillen who's going to play Brock rather deep they can't make that easy force play so that stolen base could be important in this ball game. Want to know the count to great Brock. In there for a strike one and one. So the right side of the infield is playing deep practically on the edge of the grass. There's Fletcher who is playing on the grass and Guillen the shortstop right on the edge of it. the catch right in front of the warning track to retire the side. But the Brewers tie it up and will return after this word from your local station. Well, you talk about the guy who gets a lot of the credit. Behind that number 46 is Walt Riniak, the batting coach. Yeah, Walt Riniak, though, not a great player. You see that number there in the major leagues, almost 100 at-bats, no extra base hits. But he's taken Charlie Lau's theory and I think beyond just the theory, it's the work ethic, the time that he spends with these guys, getting them in the frame of mind to go out and hit against whoever's pitching that day, as well as help them with the mechanics of hitting. Von Calderon, who has a triple and a single, has driven in a run and scored a run, swings and misses for a strike. Between Calderon and Sosa, those two have hit for the cycle today with a single, double, triple, and home run. Sox and the Brewers all knotted up at 3-3 here in the bottom of the sixth inning. The bluff to bunt there and the count one ball and one strike. Balderone led the White Sox in virtually every offensive category in last year and has had a good month of August. Hopes the same holds true this time around. Lines it foul. Low bridge right past the Milwaukee dugout and a lot of the players come up to the top step to see where exactly that ball landed. That's always a concern and you know that the old ballparks that we talk about and we enjoy them so much because the fans can sit close to the action but line shots like that can also make it a little dangerous sitting in those field level box seats. Ball and two strikes to the leadoff hitter Calderon here took something off the pitch lifts a fly ball to center field plenty of room for Robin Yount. And there's one gone. Calderon retired for the first time today. Well, tomorrow at 1 o'clock Eastern, CBS Sports presents live flag to flag coverage of the Die Hard 500 from the Talladega Super Speedway. Defending champion Terry Labonte battles Richard Petty, Bill Elliott, and the two time winner Dave Earnhardt. That's tomorrow at 1 o'clock Eastern on CBS Sports. And Earnhardt will be on the pole. And Walter, Walter Payton isn't in that race? No. <laughs> no. Don't know why. Maybe Michael Jordan will try that sport. He tried this one this week. Did pretty well at it. Dan Pasqua, the designated hitter, takes up high ball one. Pasqua has singled and struck out today. One out in the White Sox, six. Change up in for the strike. Higuera is one. now becoming into this game, Dick, the kind of pitcher that he was known as when he first started in the major leagues trouble early but once he gets by the first three he's tough but the last few starts have been different than that. Fouled at the plate. McGarrett began his career with a lot of success against the White Sox. In fact he won his first four decisions but lately has drawn a blank has dropped six in a row to Chicago. Yeah, we're talking about a guy who over the last few years has been a Cy Young threat has finished in the top five five voting a couple times and, and I think Tom Treb Treblehorn win or lose needs to start getting some consistent seven eight inning outings out of this guy if they're going to win the American League East or get back in it. He and Basio they can't win it without those two. And the pitch hits Pasqua and he'll trot down to first base. Well he threw him the breaking ball then wanted to push him off the plate. You see Serhoff setting up but the ball comes out a little early and gets Pasqua on the forearm. We've seen a lot of those this year. Jeff Brantley broke Benito Santiago's arm, and he also hit Luis Salazar in last week's ball game in that same spot. That fastball coming up and in. Hitters aren't as ready for it. They're diving into the pitch. Carlos Martinez has been retired twice by Higuera. So Pasqua, without much speed, a changeup is butted and fouled back. 
Strike one to Martinez. Martinez swung a good bat last year, and that's one of the things that the White Sox wish they would get in the second half of this year. Came up as a shortstop in the Yankee organization, another guy they acquired by way of trade from the Yankees. One out, one on, 3-3 three, three to score. Swung on and missed. Teddy Aguera after hitting the hitter looks over and checks with Greg Brock and also Jim Gantner just to see who's covering first base. The 0-2 to Martinez up high. Aguera. Mar Excuse me, Dick. You see Martinez with that long swing. Guys like this at 6-5 are going to have a lot more trouble with that long swing getting to the ball rather than the Ozzie Gians. Up, fouled out of play. Ball at two strikes. Martinez hit 300 last year in 109 games. His average has dropped off. Came into this one hitting 223. He's been moved around a lot in the infield. Finally, settling on at first base. Pasqua with the lead. And the pitch is lined to left field. Vaughn is going back, and he's there. Jumps at the warning track to makes the catch, and uh, Pasqua, who is practically the second, scampers back. And there are two down. Martinez giving that one a ride, and with two away, that'll bring up White Sox catcher Ron Karkabais. He's got a bit of a longer swing, but boy, he got the bat head out on that one. Vice 0 for 2 this afternoon. Fouls it back. White Sox score two in the first inning. Sammy Sosa hit Higuera's first pitch of the game for a home run into the left field stands. Pasqua singled home Calderon to a triple for the second run. Calderon then drove in Sosa with the third Chicago run. But homers by Sheffield and Brock made it 3 to 2. And the Brewers tied it in the sixth inning. One ball and one strike now. The count to Karkovas. Brewers taking advantage of an error by Melito Perez, who has since departed. An RBI single by Sheffield tied the game in the top half of this sixth inning. Two down, runner at first base. Breaks in there for a call strike two. We can see the control of Igarra's breaking ball really improved since the first inning when he couldn't get that over and was getting beaten on the fastball and some change-ups. And there goes Pasqua. Swung on and missed on the off-speed pitch. And that'll be strikeout number four for Higuera. And we've completed six and we're all tied 3-3. Three-five and one for the White Sox. Three-four and oh for the Brewers. And, you know, growing up, as you did, Jim, and... Uh, Zealand, Michigan, huh? You the, Dutch man, the Dutch boy growing up in Michigan. You came here as a youngster, and this is a lot of memories from this park as a youngster. Yeah, this, this really is my favorite. I tried out here, broke in here in 59 against the year the uh, White Sox won the pennant against the Go-Go Sox with Fox and Aparicio, an early win, and a lot of fond memories here. B.J. Serhoff takes a strike from Ken Patterson leading off the seventh inning. Jim Gander and Bill Spires, bottom third of the Brewer, uh, Brewers batting order. Now, uh, you always ask players, who was your favorite as a kid? Who was yours? Bobby Shantz. He didn't pitch. Well, he pitched in this ballpark when he would come in with the Philadelphia A's, greatest fielding pitcher in the history of baseball, about 5'7". Serhoff hits a fly ball to left field. And Yvonne Calderon coming on in. And there's one away. Well, the similarity between you and Shans ends with 5-7 and you being 6-5, yeah. but not the great fielding pitchers both of you were. Well, I'll tell you, you know, my dad was a great Connie Mack fan, Philadelphia A's fan, and that's where I picked up my interest in uh, in baseball and the A's, and then Bobby Shantz became my hero, living now outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Jim Gantner with one.
one out here in the seventh inning. Paid attendance today, 40,268. That's about 4,000 below capacity. And they have drawn exceedingly well this year in Comiskey Park. Fly ball hits the center field. Dave Gallagher coming on over and makes the catch. You've talked talk so much about what you call the swing run in a game. What is that, and uh, are we approaching that? Today? Yeah, we can we can throw a lot of numbers at baseball people, but there's only about three or four that managers pay attention to. 27 outs in a game, and then hitting, you want to score four or more. Look at the White Sox. When they score four or more, they're 43 and 13. Three or fewer, they've actually doubled the Brewers' win total, but they're one of the few teams that wins a fair amount of games, even when they score three runs or less. But here we have a 3-3 tie. And with these bullpens, the key run today, as it is often, is that fourth run. Bill Spires, 0 for 2, bounced into a double play and popped up, trying to bunt his way on. And a one-hopper back to Patterson. And Patterson has retired six batters since coming in for Melito Perez. We go to the bottom of the seventh all time. Tommy Lasorda's Dodgers are a candlestick against the Giants for the amazing Mets taking with their NL East rivals, the Cardinals, next Saturday. White Sox coming up in the last of the seven, 3-3 three, three the score. We mentioned Michael Jordan. You know he's a golfer. Well, he came up to Comiskey Park and hit one of these. Can you imagine that? Uh, well, that's air baseball. <laughs> that's right. And did he have a whale of a time hitting a couple of balls out of the park? Might want to be another Bo Jackson. He said he kind of liked that baseball. I'm sure if he put his mind to it, Mr. Cod, he could do well, it. Well, he's become a pretty good golfer so a guy with that kind of wouldn't surprise you bottom third of the White Sox order in the last of the seventh against Ted Higuera Scott Fletcher Dave Gallagher and Ozzie Guillen ground ball up the middle through the box base hit the first hit for the White Sox since Calderon single back in the third inning. Yeah, this is the thing with the White Sox going back to their hitting coach that we've talked about. Not a lot of extra base hits, but this is what they do so well. They're pesky. A little base hit up the middle. They butt guys over. They steal bases, and that's what they're going to try to do here to manufacture one more run, which if you look at these bullpens, Plesak and Thigpen and Barry Jones, one run should win it most of the time. And there you see Larry Haney yeah. on the phones, and we're going to have bullpen activity. Jamie Navarro, who was up earlier, again throwing for the Brewers. There he is. Now he's taking the place of Chuck Krim, who, when healthy, is probably one of the best setup men in the league. Right hander Krim, but he's on the disabled list right now, so Navarro trying to fill that role. So Fletcher is on at first base. Gallagher, let's see if the hit and run will be on or a sacrifice attempt. Looking to bunt and Sheffield and Brock charging from the corners, taken for ball one. On deck is Ozzie Guillen, and again, the uh, the worth of having a player like Ozzie Guillen batting in the number nine's position. And a guy like Gallagher, who's not a home run hitter. You got these guys at the bottom of the order that can punt, hit, and run. Jeff Torborg has a couple of options. Barry Jones is up and throwing for the White Sox in their bullpen. Nobody out, runner at first. Here's the bunt attempt. It's a good one. And only one play for Hergera over to Jim Gander covering for the force. Sacrifice is successful, and Fletcher now is in scoring position at second base. Remember, uh, a couple weeks ago, we mentioned in Fenway Park how important it is to get a lead off second base with that short left field. And Scotty Fletcher right now just turned around and looked at all of the Brewer outfielders because with Ozzie, Ozzie Guillen in the batter's box, they should be playing quite a bit shallower than they would with a power hitter. And that means that Fletcher's got to get a little better lead if he wants to score from second base. Ian has been retired twice. Outfield basically playing Ozzy straight away and not deep. Aguera's first pitch, trying to slap and go the other way with it, fouls it out of play. Strike one to Gian. For Higuera, his last victory was July the 5th when he went seven innings to beat the Oakland A's. He has not gone beyond five innings since. And here he is working in the seventh inning in a tie 3-3 game. On 
deck. Sammy Sosa in the top of the White Sox order. Good eye. Pitch taken for a ball, one and one. Lieutenant Garrett, Chris Bazio are the number one and two guys in this Brewers staff. They have won but two of their last 21 starts between them, and those are the two guys, if they get back in it, have got to improve. And Molotar getting back, too. Tom Treblehorn says we need that and much better defense. Here's the 1-1. Slap back to the mound. Higuera will hold Fletcher at second, and Guillen is retired at first for the second out. And here's where the, the bench becomes to becomes a factor for both teams. Mentioned Rob Deere on the Milwaukee bench. Now you've got Sammy Sosa, who's had a big night. Haney's a uh, big day. Haney's going to come out and talk with Higuera. If they should choose to walk Sosa to get to Ventura, mentioned Carlton Fisk and Ron Kittle. That Jeff Torbor can go to. With Larry Haney and Andy Etchebar and a couple of old Baltimore Oriole catchers on the coaching staff of the Brewers. And Tom Trevelhorn, of course, with another great former Baltimore Oriole, Don Baylor. He mentioned the influence that he and Dave Parker have had on young players like Gary Sheffield. And you ask Baylor, well, who influenced you? Frank Robinson, Dave Parker, Willie Stargell. They all had that kind of role model early in their career that had an influence on them. today in Kansas City at 95 games. Well, what he did during that streak is, is call attention to something that I think a lot of baseball people may have forgotten, that he is a good defensive player as well as a good hitter. Here's Sammy Sosa with a homer and a double and three trips to the plate. They're going to put him on and pitch to Robin Ventura. So we'll see how Jeff Torborn wants to play it now. allowed Ventura to hit even or to start really even against left hand pitching but now you're talking about the seventh inning of a game where one hit could win it for you so a few thoughts going through his mind you don't want to give up defense in this situation but you need a run to win it this is the first walk given up by Higuera it's an intentional pass and that'll put runners at first and second with two men out here in the bottom of the seventh inning and Ventura will come up and bat Trotting down to first is Sosa. Fletcher is on at second base. He led off with a single. And here's Robin Ventura, who is 0 for 3 this afternoon, but last time up hit the ball sharply to center field. I think this is one of those cases we mentioned with Andre Dawson last week, where Dick Williams, early in his career, let him hit in situations like this, even though the percentages may have been against him, because down the road, this guy's going to be an impact player for this team. Two on and two out. 3-3 the score. Breaking ball is up high. 1-0 the count. Ventura had a seven-game hitting streak snap last night. It was his longest streak of his. This is rookie year. 23-year-old out of Santa Monica, Santa Maria, California. Check swing, and the breaking ball is in. 1-1 one one now. Aguera has allowed three runs on six hits. One intentional walk, struck out four, and hit a batter. Allowed one home run. Outfield is straight away, and the infield is playing bunch toward the middle against Robin. Now Gander moving over a little more to the right. And now they, I guess, they want Surhoff to come out and run through those signs again. Well, a couple things. Number one, you, you always change the signs when there's a man on second. You change the sequence. Nobody on, maybe you use the first sign. Man on second, you use a third. The signs are as old as the game itself. One's a fastball, two's a curve, three's a slider. Wiggle your fingers for a change. But the other thing you have to be leery of is a guy like Scotty Fletcher looking in and telling Robin Ventura the location of the pitch. Give him a little edge, which the catcher can give away. Territory. Serhoff has a play. And Higuera pitches out of it. And after seven completed, Comiskey Park, 3 3 our score. CBS Sports presents Major League Baseball. Today's game is brought to you by Buick, the new symbol for quality in America. Reebok, it's time to play. 
and buy new Bud Dry Cold Filtered for smooth draft taste and dry brewed for no aftertaste. Comiskey Park on a muggy Saturday afternoon in July. Tied 3-3. The White Sox had a 3-0 lead, but single runs in the fourth, fifth, and sixth. Tied it up from Milwaukee, and now we'll have a pinch hitter for Darrell Hamilton, who's the leadoff hitter. It'll be Mike Felder, only 5-8 switch hitter, who will be batting from the right side. He's hitting 213 as a right-handed batter. One homer, 12 runs batted in. Facing Ken Patterson, and the first pitch is low ball one. Here again are those statistical things that come into a manager's mind. Rob Deere's hitting the buck 28 in day games, whether it's right or left-handed, so Trevelhorn hesitant to use him here, even though one run could win this game. Down is two balls and no strikes. Trevelhorn trying to put together some sort of a winning streak here in this American League Eastern Division which really is up for grabs looking at six clubs if you want, although the Red Sox leading today over the Tigers. Two balls and a strike. The count to Felder. And a line drive base hit in the left field. Base hit for Felder. And the go-ahead run is on at first base. And right now for an update, let's check in with Greg Gumbel in New York. Greg? Well, Dick, it's no longer a scoreless tie at Shea Stadium. In the seventh inning, Willie McGee tees off on David Cohn. Only his second home run of the year, just barely over the wall, but it counts. And the Cardinals have broken a the tie. They lead it 1-0 in the seventh. Dick? Willie McGee, one of the players that could be involved in a deal, perhaps, before the deadline. And Jeff Torborg has gone in, and that'll be all for Ken Patterson. Don Paul, who's been warming up, will come into the bullpen, the third White Sox pitcher, when we come back. Tie score here in the eighth inning at Comiskey Park. Sammy Sosa and Yvonne Calderon have had big days offensively for the White Sox. Sosa with a home run. But Teddy Higuera has settled down and has allowed only one hit in the last four innings. Gary Sheffield has a home run. And his single tied it up, so he has driven in two runs this afternoon, and now the Brewers have the go-ahead run at first base, and you're looking at Don Paul, who's the third pitcher of the day for the White Sox. Ken Patterson worked two innings, allowed one hit, and responsible for Felder on it first. And Don Paul is one of those rare products of the White Sox farm system. They drafted him in 1985. He's got both the split finger, which he'll throw rather hard, and then the fork ball. That's an off-speed split finger. I wonder whether Yount will be bunting here. He bunted with a man on second and no outs to move him up. You would think he would do it again, but he's also very adept at shooting the ball in the hole between first and second. On deck is Gary Sheffield. Squares around the bunt, takes up high. Ball one. Don Paul picked up his first save of the season this past week, going four innings. That's the longest he has worked. And you won't see the middle inning guys go that long when you have the likes of the thick pen and even a Radinsky. Radinsky warming up for Chicago. Mike Felder with a pinch hit single his first time he has hit safely. There's a bunt. Fair ball down the first baseline. They're going to let it roll and it goes foul. Smart move by Carlos Martinez. A smart move in 1990, but you remember we mentioned the Go-Go Sox in 1959. They've had one of the great groundskeepers here. <laughs> right. For years, the Bossard brothers, Roger, the son of Gene, is now the groundskeeper. But when Aparicio and Fox and Minoso were here, the, the baselines were beveled in, and the ball would stay fair. And these guys would bunt the ball down the line, and it would never go foul. <laughs> Duffy Dyer is out. Steps out of the box for the sign. The count, one ball and one strike. Third baseman Robin Ventura is even with the bag at third. Throw to first. Getting back safely is Felder. Felder has 10 stolen bases in 16 attempts this year. 3-3 three, three to score, top of the eighth inning. And Don Paul concerned about Felder over there. have out hit the Brewers six to five. There's a breaking ball in the bunt. And Karkovice is thrown a second, not in time. And everybody is safe. Daryl 
Cousins was right there. And Jeff Torborg is out to argue it. It'll be a sacrifice and a fielder's choice, and everybody is safe. Felder is in at second, and Yount is on at first. Well, Torborg didn't agree, but the guy who had the best look at it was Darrell Cousins. Yount punts a very difficult fork ball, Karkovice, and watch it right there, and tiny Mike Felder gets that hand in ahead of time. Cousins made the right call, and he didn't get the benefit of the replay. I don't even think it's that close. Karkovice, who could catch and throw as well as any catcher in the American League, out once again. You come here looking for Robin Yount to add to his hit total and knock in runs, but it's a couple of sacrifice punts that he's made today that have helped the Brewer team tie it and also have a chance to take the lead. In the sixth inning, he sacrificed and Perez committed an error. Sheffield then singled home the tying run, and now Gary Sheffield with two of the three runs batted in today, including a home run, is in the position again. Brewers with runners at second and first. Felder at second, Yount on at first. And now you got another one of those bunt situations with Sheffield. Did you think he might let him hit? They're charging from the corners. The first pitch, it's bunted hard back to the mound, but the only play for Paul is the first, and the runners will advance. Sheffield sacrifices, Felder to third, and Yount to second base. And there's one gone. Jeff Torborg's glad he's got a five or a six-man bullpen. I mean, games like this are fun. Here's a guy has got a home run. 15 game hitting streak he gets called on to bunt in a situation where you'd be tempted to let him hit you haven't even used Radinsky Barry Jones or Thigpen yet if you're Jeff Torborg now one of those situations going to walk Parker pitch to the right hander well Parker's due he's 0 for 3 in this game and they're going to walk him to load the bases now if you want to look at left handed hitters Dale Swain, a switch hitter, is available, but he is the only one, I believe. He'd be the only one, and I think that might be why would keep uh, Jeff Torborg from bringing Radinsky in. He'd rather have the right-handers facing Quan and not get Deer off that bench, even though his average is low. He's, he's got that home run power. So the bases are loaded for Greg Vaughn with one out. So. White Sox will be looking for a ground ball for a possible double play. Brewers hope to get a fly ball. There's Mike Felder on at third base. Robin Yount at second. And Dave Parker, who's just walked intentionally at first, one away. And Greg Vaughn, who walked his first time up, bounced out and struck out. Three three to score here in the top of the eighth inning at Comiskey Park. And a fly hit to left center field should get the run home Calderon is back there tagging up his Felder he'll score easily as the throw comes in and the Brewers have taken a four to three lead RBI for Vaughn is 44th of the year that run will be charged to Ken Patterson and there are two down Yount remains at second, Parker at first. And now it'll be Greg Brock's turn. But coming out from the White Sox dugout is Jeff Torborg. And he's going to make the move. Scott Radinsky. And he'll be pitcher number four of the day for the White Sox, who once led three to nothing in this game. the conclusion of today's game Jim Cott and I will select the Chevrolet most valuable player of the game mostly Jim Chevrolet will donate one thousand dollars in the players behalf to the Special Olympics you can make me like, make that choice that <laughs> here, here is a modern day ball player and a left hander Scott Radinsky never played higher in class A ball you see his numbers has his own rock band rides his bike to the park has no idea who played this game ten years ago and doesn't care but he's got a live fastball and a good hook that he can get over and Rob Deere, who leads the Brewers with 17 home runs, and you can just look at him to know that he can slug the ball, 46 home runs, will be batting for Greg Brock. Brewers lead it 4-3, to three, two out, runners at first and second. Facing Scott Radinsky, the left-hander, the fourth hurler of the day for Jeff Torborg. First pitch fastball misses. Got 
he's got a little heat. And, and like a lot of left-handers, he has that sort of a hitters would call it a funky motion. A little irregular kick with the leg and kind of three-quarter arm action. Fouls it out of play. Deer has averaged 28 home runs a season in his last four years. His problem is that he strikes out a great deal. Last year, he had 26 home runs. Never really hit for average. 200 points difference between him facing a lefty and a righty. Tells you he has a little trouble with that slider from the right-handers. Here's the 1-1 pitch. In the air to right field. Late start for Sammy Sosa. And he finally makes the catch. And that could have been big trouble for the White Sox. But the Brewers take the lead anyway. And we go to the last of the eight. Four to three to score. We go to the bottom of the eighth inning. And the Milwaukee Brewers making some changes. Mike Felder, who pinch hit a base hit to start it off with the Brewers in their go-ahead inning, now is in left field. Rob Deere, who ended the inning with a fly ball, is now the right fielder. Dale Swain is the new first baseman. And the new pitcher is Jamie Navarro. Jamie Navarro trying to fill in for Chuck Krim, the usual right-handed setup man who's on the disabled list. But Navarro, who was projected as a starter, came to the big leagues with big expectations, tried to overthrow the ball, tried to throw it 100 miles an hour and, and a real hard slider. And now he's got a little more confidence throwing within himself, as they say. Pretty good slider. And the son of a former big leaguer, Julio Navarro, was a right-hand pitcher with the Angels in the early 60s, now a minor league coach with the Atlanta Braves. And his job right here, just to get maybe a couple outs this inning or get to the ninth for Dan Plesak. Yvonne Calderon will lead off in the bottom of the eighth inning. Two for three with a triple and a single. Has scored a run and has knocked in a run. He leads the White Sox, having driven in 48 runs this year, facing Jamie Navarro, who has allowed just one earned run in 12 and a third innings in his last four appearances. So he has been effective. Four to three to score. Bluffing the bunt and taking a fastball for a strike. Sheffield at third and Swaim at first are guarding the line. Protecting against the extra base hit. Foul out of play and the count. No balls and two strikes to Calderon. Well, you know, unusual in these days, you look out at this Brewer ball club and with the exception of Rob Deere, every player on the field is a product of the Brewers farm system. There's a lot for Harry Dalton and company. Dan Plesak is warming up the ace reliever. Slider is low and the count is with ball and two strikes on deck. Dan Pasqua. Plesak. The ace of the pen. Been one of the more effective left-handed relief pitchers for many years. And the guys he's probably going to have to face if he wants to nail this one down eventually is going to be Fisk and Kittle. Right-handed swingers on the bench for the White Sox. Here's the one two pitch. He wanted that one misses two balls and two strikes to Calderon. Well, you'd have to say that the umpiring crew today has done a good job Tim Cheetah behind the plate because when you don't notice umpires and their names don't come up a lot that means they've done a good job and I think the strike zone has been very uh, fair for both sides today. I haven't heard much arguing. Took something off the pitch. It's grounded a shortstop Spires bobbles it the throw in time. And Calderon is retired one away in the eighth inning. Teddy Higuera worked seven innings and it's his game to win here. Well Sheffield was tried there. Kiki Diaz early in the year did a good job defensively but now Billy Spires gets the opportunity and even though he bobbles it still gets the out. Actually it was the White Sox defense the error on Melito Perez so far it's been the only error of today's game. One out Dan Pasqua the hitter. Facing a right-handed pitcher for the first time today. Prefers that. Although he got a hit. It's also hit by a pitch from Higuera. It was one for two officially against Teddy. Now against Navarro. Swings and fouls off the fastball. Milwaukee Brewers are in sixth place right now, but a very tight division. In the Eastern Division of the American League. Coming in Milwaukee, a game behind Cleveland. Game and a half behind Detroit three behind third place Baltimore. So the Brewers have a lot at stake themselves. 
One ball, one strike. You know, there are very few power hitters that have good power the opposite way. They're basically pull hitters. But look how deep Mike Felder is. Pasqua hit one in the left field stands here last night. Great power the other way. That's unusual. Bounce to second base. Gantner over to Swain to gone. I had mentioned earlier that Robin Yount had more opposite field home runs. Actually, Bo Jackson does in the American League. Cal Daniels in the National. And then Yount is right there just behind those guys. Carlos Martinez is going back to the bench and we're going to have a pinch hitter. Well, he let off last night's game and if Dave Gallagher wasn't in the lineup, why he'd be starting Lance Johnson. Shows you once again the versatility of this White Sox ball club. They've got Johnson, Kittle, and Fisk. Three guys who were instrumental in last night's game aren't even playing today and are still available. Johnson is hitting 278 with one homer and 36 runs batted in. He has 18 stolen bases, so he's a threat to go if he gets on. Mark of Ice is on deck, but no one is in the on-deck position right now. Carlton Fisk, of course, is available. Two out, nobody on base. Lance Johnson facing Navarro. Swings in the first pitch hit out to left center field. Mike Felder on the run makes the catch. Crossing in front of Robin Yount in a 1-2-3 inning for Jamie Navarro. And we go to the top of the ninth, 4-3 Milwaukee. Well, Lance Johnson, who went up to pinch hit for Carlos Martinez, now will move to center field, replacing Dave Gallagher. Steve Lyons is the new first baseman. He's the guy that uh, forgot where he was when he was yeah, dusting himself off, right? Got down to first base, cleaning a little dust out, and the pants fell down. He's looking for one of those Jim Palmer commercials. <laughs> B.J. Serhoff leading off against Scott Radinsky who runs up to Bunn and takes a strike. Serhoff is 0 for 3 this afternoon. Not a bad idea right there. B.J. Serhoff looks back says was that a strike. Have trouble hitting this guy. You might as well try to punt and get on. Outfield plays him around to the left. Breaking ball in for a strike 0 and 2 now to Serhoff. Looking ahead to the White Sox ninth inning they'll have Ron Karkovice, Scott Fletcher, and Steve Lyons, the schedule hitters, six, seven, and eight spots. And even though most managers go to their closers, I mean, these kind of guys can get lefties or righties out, but when you're looking at a Fisk and a Kittle, I would think that maybe Tom Treblehorn may leave Navarro out there and try to face the right-hand hitters until he gets into trouble. Because you're better off facing the schedule hitters than you know, bringing in your ace and having to face tough right-handed batters. It's, it's more, not so much who's going to be in there pitching for you, but who you want to, to face who. Yeah, yeah, everything comes into consideration. It's not just right versus right, but it's who the right-hand hitters are. With Kittle and Fisk, you're looking about a couple, at a couple bona fide home run threats. No balls and two strikes to Serhoff. And he loops one down the right field line. It'll drop for a base hit. Be hit number six for Milwaukee, leading off the ninth. Right now, let's check in with Greg Gumbel in New York for an update. Well, Dick, they've broken the scoreless tie at Toronto. John Russell of the Texas Rangers, a two-base hit down the left field line to get Julio Franco home. Newly acquired John Candelaria then surrendered an RBI single to Harold Baines, and the Rangers lead it 2-0 in the bottom of the eighth. Dick? All right, Greg, and that could serve to tighten the... American League East race. Of course, the Red Sox handling the Tigers, but Toronto trailing now. Here's Jim Gander looking to bunt, and they're charging from the corners. Takes ball one. Gander 0 for 2 with the walk. Brewers right now with none out and a runner on looking for an insurance run. And a good little spot to have Jim Gantner up there because he's a guy that's not going to bail out on Rodinsky no matter how hard he throws. He can bunt. He can slap it past the third baseman. Squares around, bunts it in the air, and it'll be the pitcher, Rodinsky. And, well, the he, and he can also bunt it in the air. <laughs> well, the intentions were good. There's Jeff Torborg leaving Radinsky out there because mostly left-handed threats here for the Brewers down at the bottom of the lineup. You know, Radinsky and the Yankees reliever Alan Mills are the first two pitchers to jump from A ball to the major league since Doc Gooden did it for the Mets in 1984. I think you're going to see more of the double-A jumps. Maybe not A. That's highly unusual. But double-A, you got guys sort of in fresh atmospheres. Triple-A can often be a, 
a kind of an atmosphere where you have a lot of veteran players that maybe aren't happy with what happened to them in the big league level and so that the attitude's a little fresher of a young player coming out of double A than triple A. Zerhoff the runner at first base. He's got 13 stolen bases. He's a threat to run. Good speed for a catcher. As Spires takes ball one. In at third is Ventura. Duffy Dyer giving the sign to Spires. Played football one year to Spires at Clemson in the Atlantic Coast Conference. There's another factor right now that we haven't talked about is the bleacher fans out in center field. I think about Spires against Radinsky and day games. It's so difficult to pick up the ball here has for years with that kind of background. Fastball in there for a strike. The See, bleacher right, fans. Yeah right below the scoreboard and either on the right field or left field side. I remember Harmon Killiver used to talk about Gary Peters about six four coming out of that area and very difficult to pick up the ball out of that background. Some with uh, white shirts, some with no shirts. So that was your big advantage. Yeah, yeah. you got it. Okay. 1-1. One, one. Took something off the pitch. Foul back by Spires. A ball in two strikes. Remember it was Peters and Pizarro in the, well, about 64 when the White Sox threatened. The Yankees ended up winning the pennant in the World Series. And then along came Tommy John and Johnny Pizarro, Point Wilhelm. But Peters and Pizarro, a couple of left-handers that did very well in this ballpark. One ball and two strikes with one out. I want to correct myself. The Cardinals won the World Series. The Yankees won the pennant. And the Cardinals with uh, Tim McCarver playing yeah. a major role. Huh? Timmy would not appreciate hearing that. I think he hit about a thousand in that. World. I think 600 or something in that World and Series. Stole home. Yes. Like Two balls and two strikes to Bill Spires. One out, a runner at first base for the Brewers. They're leading four to three. They were trailing three to nothing into the fourth inning today. High chopper. Gian's only play is to first in time to get Spires. Sirhop will advance to second base, and there are two down. Just a high, harmless hopper towards short, but at least for the Brewers, instead of the force out, they get another runner into scoring position, which if that run comes home, that'll make Tom Treblehorn's decision a little bit easier as to whether to, to leave Navarro in the game or to bring on Plesak. There's the sign from Treblehorn to his coaches. Here's Mike Felder who pinch hit a single to start the rally in the eighth inning that put Milwaukee in front. Swings and fouls it off for a strike. Tiny Mike Felder, 5'8", but he can pack a wallop at times. Greg Vaughn, who drove in the go-ahead run with a sacrifice fly last inning. Home runs by Sheffield and Brock for the Brewers today, and Sammy Sosa with a leadoff home run on the first pitch of the game for Chicago. There's the bunt attempt. Trying to bunt his way on, but Radinsky is there to make the play, and the side is retired, so the White Sox come up for their last chance, trailing the Brewers 4-3. to three. Sox coming up in the last of the ninth inning and Dan Plesak, the all-time Brewers save leader, and he's got 16 this year, is coming in. Navarro worked an inning effectively and Plesak, the 28-year-old left-hander, native of Gary, Indiana, is coming in to pick up a save and uh, for Teddy Higuera, who is the pitcher of record. And Tom Treblehorn is saying, even though you got some right-hand bats on that bench, this is the guy that could close it out for me, so he's going with his guy and you saw the high earned run average that could be very deceptive many think that a, an outing that jarred Dan Plesak for a while happened back in May you know before May 20th he had an outstanding record and an earned run average back it was two and a quarter but he came in against the Mariners and in that ball game gave up seven runs all earned stayed in for that entire game the Brewers earned uh, the Brewers lost and it's taken him a while to rebound from that outing. He had 33 saves last year a Milwaukee record. He was healthy. He has 100 saves the last four years coming into this season. He's been bothered by elbow and shoulder problems the prior two years. But here he is healthy again and facing Ron Karkovice who is 0 for 3 this afternoon. But 
facing Plesak. Four to three, Milwaukee leading in the last of the ninth inning. Fastball up high, so it'll be Karkovice, Fletcher, and Lyons, the scheduled hitters for the White Sox, who this year have won 13 games in their final at-bat. So they know how to come from behind. Missing outside, 2-0. Carlton Fisker, Ron Kittle, Torborg says, I'll let Karkovice take a hack at it. Felder tries to climb the wall, and this ball is just a few feet from tying the game. The White Sox now have the tying run in scoring position. And even though he doesn't get a chance to play very often, Karkovice continues to contribute. And he'll go out of the game to a big hand from the 40,000-plus. Ron Karkovice leading off the ninth with a double. And as Jim mentioned, the tying run is in scoring position. Rodney McRae, just brought up from AAA, will be running for him. And Scott Fletcher will be the batter. Steve Lyons scheduled to hit, but Carlton Fisk has grabbed the bat, and he is in the dugout. No one right now is in the on-deck circle for Chicago. Now you're at home, and you're Jeff Torborg, and you got Barry Jones and Bobby Thigpen in the bullpen, so you can play to tie the game. You wouldn't do that on the road, but you can look for Scotty Fletcher here to try to drop a bunt down third toward, toward Sheffield or otherwise chop it toward the first baseline. Lee Sack, and there's a bunt, and it's foul. Bunted hard and fielded by Swain. Strike one. In the White Sox dugout, Carlton Fisk, one of the first people to arrive today for the White Sox, even though he knew he was not going to play, goes through all kinds of exercises and a routine for conditioning, and that's why he could play at the age he's playing into this morning. Yeah, the formula has worked all year. And that they give him a day off after a night game. Fans responding to Pudge coming out of the dugout. Strike one pitch. Stepping off the rubber is Plesak. Gray, who's got good speed, is on at second base. Buick open. Third round coverage coming up next here on CBS. Four to three, Milwaukee. Bottom of the ninth inning. And the pitch nearly got away. Serhoff with a good stop on a tough pitch to handle. And it's one and one. The importance of having a catcher with good mobility back there. The slider down and in, and Serhoff picks that ball. That keeps McRae from getting to third base. He would have got there without the need of a sacrifice. Dan Plesak with 16 saves, looking for number 17. And Scott Fletcher hanging in there with nobody out. The count one and one. Rodney McRae pinch running for Ron Karkovice on at second base. And a bunt and a good one. He may beat it out, and he will. Everybody's safe. Going to third is McRae. And here comes Carlton Fisk. is major for the Brewers and the White Sox. It's once again not an error. It's a play that they don't make. And now instead of walking Fisk to set up a double play, they've got a pitch to him with first and third nobody out. Batting for Steve Lyons. Carlton Fisk. Who is hitting 
276, nine homers and 33 runs batted in. And Tom Treblehorn now relying on his ace reliever against the 42-year-old Carlton Fisk, who has continued a simply marvelous career as a catcher beyond what many people thought he would move along. Yeah, and his approach right here, he knows that great slider that Plesak got. He's going to try to get a hitting count. Either that or guess fastball on the first pitch, but get Plesak an account where he can, he has to throw a fastball, he can get a pitch, he can drive. Hit a home run last night. Nobody out, tying run at third. Winning run is at first, ball one, the fifth. There's Robbie McRae, the pitch runner. Scott Fletcher at first. They play Fitch, Fisk straight away and deep. The infield, double play depth, up high. Two balls and no strikes. So Fisk should get a good pitch to hit here. Yeah, now the, the decision between Plesak and Serhoff, you say, well, I don't want to go to 3-0. and oh. You end up walking Fisk. You got Ozzy Guillen with the bases loaded. So sooner or later, you got to have some faith in your fastball, and Fisk will probably be ready for it. He's made his living like that for the last few decades. Song Turn Me Loose. <laughs> Wouldn't that's he what, love it? That's what Fisk is looking for right now for third base coach Terry Bevington. However, a walk would put the winning run on at second base for Gian. And then Sosa. Here's the 3 0 pitch. He had the green light and fouls it out of play. Well, you got a guy that's going to be in the Hall of Fame and great discipline like Carlton Fisk. I think you can put it on his shoulders as to whether to hit 3 0 or not. A lot of hitters aren't good hitters in that situation because they're over anxious, but he took a, took a good hack at that one. This this year is one for six as a pinch hitter. Three balls and a strike. Nobody out. Tying run at third. Winning run at first. Ninth inning. Ball four. And the base is alone. So Dan Plesak who got the call from Tom Treblehorn in the ninth inning, hoping that his ace reliever would close it out for Teddy Higuera, who badly needs a win. It's been anything but sharp, and the bases are loaded with none out, and Ozzie Guillen coming up, and here comes Treblehorn to the mound to talk to his pitcher. Yeah, I think this is a talk not only to the pitcher, but to the infielders. What are we going to do? We're going to play the infield end. we got to try to knock that tying run off at the plate and try to turn two. Guillen's got great speed. But right now he wants to gather his infielders and talk a little strategy with the entire crew. Now the one thing you don't want to do is play in where by a base hit you'll lose the game. If you're going to have to give up one run to tie it and send it in extra innings, that'll be all right or at least prolong the inning. But when you're looking at Plesak against Guillen, I think Treblehorn's got to say this guy, if Plesak is right, Guillen cannot hit him with authority. So we'll see what he's going to do with his infield. He may wait till he gets a strike or two on him. White Sox two and a half behind the A's who have a doubleheader coming up with the Twins tonight. Even in the loss column. And Chicago trailing now. McCray is at third. Fletcher is at second. Biscuit first. Force at any base. Fastball, and he got one up in the strike zone, fouls it off, 0-1. Oh hey, you know, we talk about baseball being a game of firsts, and Ozzie Guillen knew it. That was probably the best pitch he'll get to hit off Dan Plesak. He had a fastball up that he could hit in the air. 13 for 54, lifetime with the bases loaded. So the infield, first and third, is playing in halfway at second and short. Here's the 0-1. Swing and a miss. He went after the sweeping breaking ball, and... Plesak is ahead again, two strikes. Ron Kittle, another right-handed slugger, has a bat waiting in the wings in the dugout. Sammy Sosa is on deck for the White Sox. Not a bad guy to have coming up. Nobody out. The 0-2 pitch, check swing. 
Did he go around? No, says Terry Cooney, the third base umpire. Yeah, anytime you got a guy with a hard slider like Plesak, those corner umpires, third and first base, become important on the check swings. One and two. to the American League West lead. And the Chevrolet player of the game is the hero, Ozzie Guillen, as he has been all year long. Uh, the White Sox and Chevrolet will donate $1,000 in his behalf to the Special Olympics. Radinsky is the winner, is 6-0. Plesak loses it as Chicago wins it 5-4. Five runs, nine hits, one error. Four runs, six hits, no errors. Sosa, Sheffield, and Brock hit homers. It's our story. CBS Sports presents Major League Baseball. Today's game has been brought to you by Mr. Goodwrench, the GM service expert at your participating GM dealers. Head and shoulders because you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And by First Brands Corporation, maker of STP oil treatment and son of a gun protectant. So for Greg Gumbel and Jim Cott, I'm Dick Stockton saying so long from Comiskey Park where the final score is the White Sox 5 and the Brewers 4. You've been watching Major League Baseball on CBS Sports, the home of the League Championship Series.